نحمده ونصلي على رسوله الكريم اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اهلي اللهم فقهنا في الدين رب زدني علما اللهم اني اسالك علما نافعا رزقا طيبا وعملا متقبلا اللهم ارنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه اللهم ارنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه امين ثم امين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته سورة الأحزاب This surah was revealed in Medina. It has 73 verses, 9 stanzas. It is the 33rd by the order of arrangement and 90th by the order of revolution. The name of the surah relates to verse number 20. <clears throat> where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions al-ahzabu lam yadhabu. Ahzab is the plural for hizb and it means the group. So the surah mentions about the combined groups attacking the Islamic state of Medina. And uh, since the surah is explaining the events which took place during the battle of Ahzab, hence the surah gets its name. The time period of revolution is uh, related to the events which have been mentioned in the surah. The Battle of Trench or the Battle of Ahzab, it took place in, uh, in the fifth year after the immigration of Prophet Sallallahu to Medina. And similarly, Banu Qureza, uh, the Battle of Banu Qureza, it took place in Zikad 5AH and Nikah of Prophet Sallallahu with Hazrat Zainab anhu, also took place in Shawal 5AH. So all the events which have been mentioned in this uh, surah, they... Uh, took place in the fifth year so there is a consensus of opinion that the surah was revealed in 5 ah in the end of 5 ah and in the starting period of the sixth year as far as the topic and the summary of the surah is concerned this chapter has uh, many social resolutions like their orders for uh, the adoption of children inter-family marriages dress code and uh, the order regarding the exhibition and demonstration of adornments by the muslim women order regarding the segregation of muslim men and women then the conduct of modesty taking permission and uh, moreover there is a detailed debate about the two battles that is the battle of the trench and the battle with banu qureza and there are answers for allegations after hazza zainab radiyallahu ta'ala and has nikah and uh, there is concept of the seal of prophets that is the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam being the last prophet and there is uh, the excellence and also the order to recite the rood and there's much more so these are the basic subjects which have been touched in the chapter bismillahir rahmanir rahim <coughs> يا ايها النبي اتق الله ولا تطع الكافرين والمنافقين ان الله كان عليما حكيما واتبع ما يوحى اليك من ربك ان الله كان بما تعملون خبيرا وتوكل على الله وكفى بالله وكيلا O Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam fear Allah and do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites indeed Allah is ever knowing and wise and follow that which is revealed to you from your lord indeed Allah is ever with what you do acquainted and rely upon Allah and sufficient is allah as disposer of affairs in these first three verses there is a very important message 
and important instructions for an Islamic state. Because in the background is the whole of the event of uh, the Battle of Trench. And we realized that Surah Ahzab was revealed when there was a small Islamic state of Medina. And there was a threat of being attacked by huge armies of combined enemies. Now, in such an insecure scenario, the Muslims are being suggested a charter of uh, four points. And these four points has a few don'ts and do's and don'ts. The first is ittaqillah, fear Allah. This is similar as what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Baqarah. That do not fear them and fear me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Islamic State and the Muslims not to fear their enemies, however strong they are, and just to fear their Lord. The Lord who is the controller, who is the controller of the universe and who is the sovereign. This is a do, ittaqillah, and then after a do, there is a don't. Wala tuti'il kafirina wal munafikin. That do not follow the disbelievers and the hypocrites. Why are they supposed to do this and why is this important? Inna Allah kana aliman haqima. And then if we do not follow them, who do we follow? Allah says, Then you follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to you. And uh, why should you do so? In Allah kana habira, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ever knowing and is acquainted with what you are up to and what you're going to do. <clears throat> so what you do after doing these things, Allah says, What Allah that have reliance on Allah. And why do you do that? Waqafa billahi waqila, that Allah is sufficient as disposer of affairs. So under those adverse conditions, what is being suggested to Prophet Sallallahu is not only for the state of Medina, this is for all the Islamic states facing a similar situation till the day of judgment. <coughs> Verse number four, Allah has not made for a man two hearts in his interior, and he has not made your wives whom you declare unlawful your mothers, and he has not made your adopted sons your true sons. That is merely your saying by your mouths, but Allah says the truth, and he guides to the right way. In this verse, Allah is mentioning that there have been never two hearts in the chest cage of any man. And if we statistically see, this is, this is actually how it is. Statistics also do confirm that. And we see in medical sciences, reports of medical sciences, we do find that the side of the heart might be reversed from the heart being on the left side, it might be reversed to being placed in the right side of the chest cage. And this is a condition which is called as dextrocardia in medicine. Or all the organs of the body, they might be reversed, they might be placed in the opposite sides. And this is known as situs inversus in medical sciences. But never, never has there been a condition when a person has two hearts. So the condition of cardiac duplication has never, ever existed. So that is what Allah is saying, that two things, that two things you say are as next to impossible as the duplication of the heart in the human chest. And what these two things are, these are the two customs of Arabs which are being negated here. The first is the concept of Zihar, and the second is the adoption of sons by them. Zihar was a custom in the Arabs that if the husband vowed and he told his wife that she is as lawful to her as his mother, then they thought that this was exactly like divorcing the wife. And she would, by actually the husband saying this by his word of mouth, she would actually become unlawful on the account of the words spoken. So Allah has negated here, saying that just by saying such a thing, it is not possible that the wife will become haram. <coughs> 
I shall be talking about the orders of zihar in detail in Surah Mujadala, inshallah. The second is regarding adoption. Arabs, they used to consider their adopted sons as their real sons. And this false concept has been corrected and has been rectified here. And Allah has given the correct guidance regarding the order for adoption. Adoption is although allowed in Islam, but it is allowed according to a specific charter. In this verse, Allah has mentioned only about the adoption of sons because it was a male dominated society where they used to kill and they used to bury their daughters alive. And so obviously there was no chances of adopting girls at all. But the verse has a ruling for adoption both of daughters and sons. Now the first order is that if you do adopt a child, then you do what? That call them by the name of their actual father. And moreover, Allah is explaining that if you don't know the real father's name, then even then do not give them their give them your own entity that is do not give them the entity of the adult adopting father instead introduce them as your religious brothers the adopting child will not be given the entity of the father who is adopting the child or the child who is adopted will not be given the surname of the adopting father why is this so Firstly, because this is falsehood. This is telling a lie. And how can we imagine that a bond will prosper or it will flourish, which has been based on telling lies or falsehood? It will mean like telling lies the whole of the life to conceal the truth and to prove the false entity the parents will have to keep on lying to the child and to all those around them for the whole of their life. And moreover, you know, such affairs usually don't stay concealed for long. And if at a later stage, when the truth is revealed finally, it will come out as a shock for the child. The adopted child will be taken aback, will be shocked. And there will be a great psychological trauma and emotional crisis when the child will lose his entity. He might even get averted from the adopting parents. So it is a much more better option to stick to the truth and to introduce the true adopting parents, introduce the parents as adopting parents. So they are actually the adopting parents, so they, they don't have to go about telling lies. They are the adopting parents. They might be taken as benefactors for the child rather than being liars. Moreover, there will also be issues regarding the inheritance and the Islamic rules and regulations of Parda. The adopted son will not be a mehram for the mother and the adopted daughter, the father will not be a mehram for her. So this issue can, however, be, <clears throat> this can be uh, settled by, or it can be solved by getting the adopted child dictated by the relatives of the father or the mother to become, to develop foster relations. <coughs> <coughs> However, regarding the issue of inheritance, the adopted child will not get the share like the normal children, but the child can receive one third of the share from the property with the will of the parents. If the parents make a will, in favor of the adopted child, that part of the property the adopted child can no doubt receive. And uh, we also learn uh, from the traditions by Prophet ﷺ that Prophet ﷺ said that a person who intentionally associates himself with a man other than his father or with any other nation or a tribe makes his place in hell fire. Similarly, in another place, Prophet Salaam said that a person who associates himself with a father, despite knowing that he is not his father, then Jannah is prohibited for him. 
So this is the importance of relating to these rules which have been explained in these verses. And we learn that from the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he adopted Hazrat Zaid bin Haris Raziallahu Ta'ala and who, who was his slave boy. <coughs> Hazrat uh, Zaid bin Haris Raziallahu Ta'ala and who was being sold in the market of uh, the slave market of Fukaz and there uh, a nephew of Hazrat uh, Khadija Raziallahu Ta'ala and ha, he bought a few slaves and he brought them to Medina and then he offered Hazrat Khadija which out of all the slaves she would want to take from him and Hazrat Khadija Raziallahu Ta'ala and ha, she took Hazrat um, Zaid bin Haris Raziallahu Ta'ala and who and then when she married Hazrat uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she she presented Hazrat Zaid Raziallahu Ta'ala and who she gifted it to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam she gifted him to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and uh, there he was with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam for quite a few years. And then in the background, the family was upset, the mother was missing him and all of the family was looking for him where he had just disappeared. And one of the people of their tribe, they came to, uh, they came to Mecca for, uh, for Hajj. And there they found that Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was Allah Ta'ala and who was as a slave of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And they went back to the tribe and they informed the parents where Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was. And the father and the uncle, they brought some money and they came over to see Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, requested him to uh, release Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was Allah Ta'ala. And when they offered that they were prepared to pay for his freedom. <coughs> Hazrat uh, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that I would not decide this. I would ask Hazrat Zaid to decide where he wants to stay. So Hazrat Zaid was Allah Ta'ala and who when he was asked what he would want to do and what he would decide, Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was Allah Ta'ala and who was so, was so in love with his master. And this was why, this was because of the manners the manners in Naqala ala khulukin azim of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that has a Zaid bin Haris was Allah ta'ala and who he opted to stay, he opted to stay as a slave to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam rather than being freed, rather than going back to his family, rather than going back to his tribe and to his clan. These were the manners of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the father and the uncle, they returned. And Hazrat Zaid Raziallahu Ta'ala and who he continued staying with Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was so moved that he took hold of his hand of Hazrat Zaid bin Haris Raziallahu Ta'ala and who, and he went to the harem. And there he announced that day that from today he will be my adopted son. And for the few years following, Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was Allah Ta'ala and who used to be called as Zaid bin Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Only when these verses of Surah Ahzab were revealed that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam obviously Samirna wa Atwana, he heard to these verses and he learned the order of Allah. And then he announced that now from now onwards, uh, Hazrat Zaid bin Haris was, again, he will be called Azad bin Haris. This was what? This was an obedience, immediate obedience, which was uh, demonstrated by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. <coughs> so this was uh, what happened in the life of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam after these verses were revealed. So this is what all those who need to adopt a child, may it be a son or it be a girl, they have to be named by the name of their actual father. So Allah says, call them by the name of their fathers. It is more just in the sight of Allah. But if you do not know their fathers, then they are still your brothers in religion and those entrusted to you. And there is no blame upon you for that in which you have erred, but only for what your hearts intended. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. <coughs> Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is more worthy of the believers than themselves. 
and his wives are in the position of their mothers, and those of blood relationship are more entitled to inheritance in the decree of Allah than the other believers and the emigrants, except that you may do to your close associates a kindness through bequest that was in the book inscribed. Now, in this verse number six, Allah is mentioning that wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Umahatul Mu'mineen, they are being called as the mothers of the believers. What does this mean is that they've been called as the mothers of the believers regarding the respect, regard, and love for them. And the second thing is regarding that it was unlawful for the believers to marry them after they had been in the nikah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And mention when we took from the prophets their covenant and from you and from Nu alayhi salam and Ibrahim and Musa alayhi salam and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, the son of Maryam alayhi salam, and we took from them a solemn covenant that he may that he may question the truthful about their truth, and he has prepared for the disbelievers a painful punishment. O oh, you who have believed, remember the favor of Allah upon you when armies came to you, came to attack you, and we sent upon them a wind and armies of angels you did not see, and ever is Allah of what you do seeing. Now, from this verse starts the narration and the debate of the events of the Battle of Trench or the Battle of Ahzab. Now, I will go through the narration of the events briefly before reading the verses, because after that, it will definitely become easier to relate to the verses when we have gone through the historical events. After Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam immigrated from Mecca to Medina, in the first year, there was at, uh, in the beginning, there was a permission, and later there was an order for qital. In Surah Baqarah, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, And then followed by that, in the Ramadan of the second year, there was the Battle of Badr, in which Muslims, they had a remarkable victory. Now, in the following year, the third year, it was uh, there was the Battle of Uhud, where the Muslims, they had to bear the brunt of a heavy physical and monetary losses. Now, the Muslims, they had to suffer a sort of a defeat. And this encouraged the enemies to some extent. Now, by this time, the two Jew tribes of Banu Qainuqa and Banu Nazir, they had been turned out of Medina, and after being exiled from Medina, they had settled in Khaybar. Now, the, both these two tribes, they were revengeful, and so they instigated and they motivated the Quraysh of Mecca, along with some other tribes around Medina. And so all of them, they united, and they joined hands to attack Medina. And the purpose was so that by their combined efforts, they would be once for once for all, they would be able to finish off the following of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they would so unite for this purpose. So they united with the plan to proceed from all the directions towards Medina. Now, there was an immense threat of an attack of the Ahzab, the combined allied forces. They, they had an army of about 10 to 12,000 soldiers attacking Medina, advancing from all directions. From the north were the two Jew tribes. From the south were the Quraysh of Mecca advancing. And from the east were the Banu Ghatfan. Whereas if we realize in Medina, if all the adult men, they had joined the army, there would have been a maximum of 3,000 fighting soldiers. Now, when Prophet Sallallahu he got the news of the enemy and their intentions and their plannings, as according to the order of Quran, Prophet Sallallahu he summoned the companions for a meeting for counseling. So there was a foreigner 
uh, foreigner, Hazrat Salman Farsi, who he was from Persia, he came up with the suggestion. And uh, the suggestion of a foreigner, it was, it was heard, it was accepted because of the open-mindedness of Prophet What he suggested was that in their land, when the enemy which was, was planning to attack was huge and they could not face the enemy, what they used to do was they used to dig ditches. And the purpose of digging ditches was to stop the enemy and to save themselves. Now, this seemed as a very practical solution, especially for Medina, because of uh, the geographical landform around Medina. Medina was surrounded on three sides, on three sides, that is the northeast, the east, and the west, by huge mountains, by huge mountains of black, hard, igneous rocks. And these mountains, they were forming an excellent natural barrier on these three directions. Now, in the south was the area of the Jews of uh, Banu Koreza. And the Jews of Banu Koreza, they were still, till now, they were sticking on to the pact of the Charter of Medina. So even the south seemed to be protected. Hence, the only direction was the northwest. The northwest was the part of the border of Medina, which was unprotected and which was easy to be attacked. So it was suggested that a deep ditch in this direction would stop the marching forces and would protect Medina. Now, you know what happens is that when we are going through the historical events of the Battle of Trench, we usually read this that it was suggested by Hazrat Salman Farsi that the ditch would be dug and then the plan was executed and the dig, uh, this ditch was, uh, they, it was dug as a deterrent and we just move ahead. We just move ahead. Remember, it is easier said than done. The digging of the ditch, the digging of the ditch itself, this was actually the main difficult part. Just, just mentioning a few facts and figures for you to realize how, how difficult the whole process was. The ditch that was to be dug was three and a half miles long, 15 to 20 feet deep and about 20 to 30 feet wide. 1,20,000 square yards of land had to be dug. The land of Medina, 1,20,000 square yards of the land of Medina, which is extremely hard. The terrain of Medina, this just has a very thin layer of soil covering, but they're underlying this soil covering. There are extremely hard slates of black igneous rocks. And you know what? This immense task had to be just completed in like a max of about 20 days. And if I share my own experience with you during one of my visits to Medina, there was an extension of Master De Nabri. It was in progress. And uh, the construction used to continue for the whole of the day and used to just stop for the timings of Salah. And the whole day, the land used to vibrate it used to vibrate like anything. And the reason was because extremely heavy and the most powerful of forklifters and cranes were being used for digging and for the purpose of this construction. And we also visited the site where the supervisor, the supervisor told us that the most, the world's most powerful machinery is being used, but still it just wears off in a matter of days. And it is extremely difficult. He told us that it is extremely difficult to hire the operators for the heavy machines also, because despite the fact that they've been offered doubled wages for the jobs, but the job is so tough that just nobody stays. The machines go off and the operators run away. So there it was. I There I realized how difficult it must have been for the companions how extremely difficult it must have been for the companions who, who were just using the power of their arms. They did not have any machinery. 
So the companions, while they were digging the ditch, they did what the best machinery of today and the highly paid operators of today, they are finding this difficult. The digging of the ditch by the companions was no doubt the most remarkable feat of performance. And how was this achieved? How was this achieved and why was this achieved? Like different factors operating. The first being that Prophet Sallallahu himself, like the usual leaders, he had just not ordered, he had just not ordered for the dig, for the dish to be dug. And he just sat behind. No, the army chief, Prophet Sallallahu he himself was very much with his companions digging the ditch most of all himself. And then Prophet Sallallahu had conducted the whole process with, with an immense planning and with a remarkable organization. Prophet Sallallahu had planned and he had allotted 100 square yard area to a team of 40 people. And these 40 people was headed by one leader. So there was a remarkably organized, disciplined, and a united teamwork, which was carried on for digging. And thirdly, there was an immense sincerity. There was sincerity, there was sacrifice for the cause. The companions, they did not, they did not even had the much needed tools. They did not have the tools for digging. They had to borrow them from the people of the, from the Jews of Banu Koreza. And they also innovated tools from whatever they could find at home. And then the transporting of all this mud, they, they, they were carrying all this in their own shirts. And even Prophet Salah was found doing all that. And during the whole of the process, they were reciting verses of Quran and they were exchanging du'as with each other. They were all motivated for the, for the barter of Jannah. And you know what used to happen was that when the companions, they, they failed to break one of the few stones or one of the stone sledges, slates, they, they would come over to Prophet Salavalism to ask for help. And uh, once when the companions, despite trying, they repeatedly kept on trying, but they could not break a stone slate. They came to Prophet Salavalism and Prophet Salavalism went to the site and there he asked for a cup of water and he recited some um, some verses and then he sprinkled this water on the rock and then he struck he struck with all his might and you know what happened the rock just crumbled it crumbled down like a mound of sand what was this this was the miraculous help of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inna allah ma'aswabirin and I would also want to highlight, you know, that the companions, they were digging this ditch all this time, all this period when the companions, they were digging this ditch, they were starving. There was starvation and they were in a state of hunger with, with empty tummies and their weak, frail arms. But what was there? What was there? was the strength of Iman which kept them going, which gave them the power, which gave them the strength, which gave them the stamina, which gave them the patience, which gave them the endurance to keep going. So it was just the strength of Iman. There was a companion who came to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he lifted his shirt to show a stone tied on his belly. The purpose was what? To support the empty belly. And you know what happened? Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he lifted his shirt and he silently showed that he had two stones on his belly. The army chief, the army chief, Rahmatullah Alameen, that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Ahzab, The army chief was going through the hardships with the forces. He was not just staying back in his camp and issuing orders. No, he was there. He was there in the front with the army in all the, all the hardships. 
And there was Hazrat Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and who, when he saw this condition of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was, he was moved and he immediately ran back to his wife. He went back home and he asked his wife if there was anything, any, any food at home. And the wife, the wife was also a wife who was, who was a support for the husband, for the religion of his husband, for the, for the iman of, of her husband. These were the wives who were supporting in the path of Allah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. She replied and she informed him that there was a small goat and there, were, there was a little bit of oats in the house. And she asked him to go and invite Prophet Sallallahu to the meal and uh, she would arrange everything herself. And he went back and he invited Prophet Sallallahu for a meal at his place. But Rahmatul Alameen, who had been with all the Mujahideen through all the thick and thin, he had been with his army, he had been with his soldiers, he had been with the Mujahideen digging through all the thick and thin, could just not imagine, could just not imagine that he would eat all by himself, leaving his companions starving. He called out aloud, brothers, today we are invited at Jabir's. Subhanallah. And you know what? Hazrat Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and who he was shocked and he was upset as to how the food will be sufficient for all and how would everyone be attended. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu advised Hazrat Jabir radiallahu ta'ala and who he, he, he told him that uh, tell your wife that she should not, she should not need the dough till Prophet Sallallahu gets there. And uh, the spoon should not also be taken out of the pot till Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gets there. And when Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he arrived at the house of Hazrat Jabir Rasulullah Ta'ala and who he added his saliva in both. And so there was a miracle blessed by Allah and miraculously with the help of Allah, all the starving Mujahideen, imagine all the starving Mujahideen, they had their fill and what remained behind of all the food that was cooked was more, was actually more than that was cooked initially. This was what? This was what Prophet Sallallahu has promised. Prophet Sallallahu said that by Allah, charity does not decrease the wealth and forgiving does not decrease the honor and the respect. Instead, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala raises the grade of the person who is humbled. So spending in the path of Allah, spending for the cause of jihad does not decrease the wealth. So the, the food which was prepared by the family of Hazrat Jabir bin Abdullah who was even more than the food which it was actually prepared. So these were the miracles which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made to help all these mujahideen, the sincere mujahideen. And in a period of three weeks, this ditch was done well before the enemy had arrived. So when the enemies arrived, the combined allied forces with the strength of about like 10 to 12,000 soldiers, the enemy arrived. They were shocked. They were taken aback, stunned, extremely upset, not understanding how to go about. So initially to start with some of their very gallant leaders with Arabic stallions, they galloped across the ditch and they came towards the side of the Muslim army and there they challenged the Muslims for mubadirat, that is one-to-one -one combat. But the companions of Prophet Sallallahu they came out and they killed all of them immediately. <coughs> And uh, all, all of them were killed. And uh, so this was put to a stop right at the start. So now all what the enemy could do was that they could throw arrows. They could throw arrows across the ditch. And it was just one of the arrows which injured uh, Hazrat Saad bin Maaz, who was the leader of Oz. One of his main whistles of the leg was um, the femorals. It was injured. And uh, he, he would bleed, he would bleed profusely. And uh, after the battle, he also received martyrdom. And he was the only companion 
who, who was martyred during the Battle of Trench. And uh, we also learned that the first day when the enemy had arrived, there was it was a hectic day. Obviously, it was a it was very hectic because uh, taking care of the ditch and guarding and protecting and being mindful of all the corners and the edges. Prophet Salawalis was extremely preoccupied and he forgot to offer the Asr Salah. When Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he remembered that they had not ordered, he had not ordered his salah, he came over to Prophet sallallahu and he mentioned that he had forgotten. Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he mentioned about his own salah that he had mentioned to, he had forgotten to offer the salah of Asr. And this reminded Prophet sallallahu alayhi that he had also forgotten the salah of Asr. And uh, then he raised his hand and he said that, oh Allah, fill their houses and their graves with fire, for they have, for they have diverted us from our Salat al wusta that is the Salah of Asr. And this highlights the importance of Salah of Asr also. As has Allah ordered in Quran, salati wa salat al wusta wa lillahi qanateen, that Prophet has had never made such a supplication, a revengeful supplication for any of the enemies in his life. But this was the enemy who had diverted them from their Salah of Asr. And that is why Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi supplicated in these words for the enemy. Now, the siege lasted for 21 days. The enemy encircling and uh, they were there for 21 days and after 21 days prophet sallallahu he summoned his companions in his camp one night and he addressed them explaining the state of affairs in medina and what the state of affairs in medina were were that obviously because of the siege there was no trade there were no trade caravans coming so because of no trade there was uh, an extreme shortage of all the daily commodities and necessities of life. And moreover, there was no agriculture and there was shortage of food and there was starvation and all their families, they were also insecure and unsafe. And uh, then Prophet Salah when explaining all the state of affairs, he explained that what if the siege prolonged? So he asked, he addressed, he asked, the companions that who out of them would go to the enemy camps to investigate what the plannings and the intentions of the enemy were this was this was an extremely difficult expedition in fact this was life endangering mission and because if if a person was caught spying if a companion was caught spying by the enemy soldiers they would they would torture him to anything. They were standing there. They were waiting. They were revengeful. They were furious. They could not do anything. When they got hold of one person from the Muslims, we can just imagine what, what they would do, how they would torture to take all their fury and revenge out on that one person. So this was not only life endangering, this was like next to impossible. None of the companions responded. There was total silence. There was total silence. And you know what? Hazrat Huzaifa, Razayallahu ta'ala anhu, Hazrat Huzaifa bin Yaman, Razayallahu ta'ala anhu, he narrates the whole event which followed after this. He explains that it was a cold night, one of the coldest nights of Medina in his life. And it was pitch dark and freezing winds was blowing. And he explains his own condition that he sat in the corner of a camp, of a Prophet Sallallahu camp. He was, he was just sitting and he all what he had was a flimsy headdress of his wife, which was wrapped around his shoulders. And it was Im intensely cold. And uh, he said that Prophet Sallallahu after announcing and asking that who will go, then he started looking around. And then he fixed his gaze on me and he called out, Josefa. Now, this was what? This was the direct call of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As Allah says in Quran, that do not take the call 
of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he summons you like the summoning of others. So there was directly Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam now directly calling him one to one, asking, that was like ordering Hazrat Huzaifa radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And how did he respond? Labbaik ya Rasulullah. And he got up and he came closer to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said that I told Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that I'm not afraid of death. I'm desirous of martyrdom. But all what I am afraid of is being caught by the enemies and being persecuted by them and which might spoil my iman. And there, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he raised his hands and he supplicated and he said that, oh Allah, protect Hosefa from above and from beneath and from front and behind and guide him and help him. And this was it. Hazrat Hosefa says that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he supplicated in these words, all the feeling of that intense cold and all that fear, it all went away. And there was a warmth inside me. I started feeling warm. What warmth was this? This was the warmth of Iman. This was the warmth of Iman. This was belief. This was faith. This was reliance which developed because of the supplication of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he said that without any fear, or without being afraid of the enemy or their soldiers or their gods, I fearlessly, I descended and then I ascended through the ditch and fearlessly I crossed the roads, all the roads of the guarding soldiers unscatched because by the help of Allah, all the soldiers, they had dozed off. This was the help of Allah. This was all with the help of Allah. All the soldiers had dozed off while Hazrat Josefa, he passed unscathed through, through all the rows of the guarding soldiers. So now then he was in the open ground with thousands of camps in front of him. So now was the next stage, choosing where to start, which camp to go, where to start. Again, the help of Allah came and Allah guided him. The very first camp, Hazrat Uzefa himself explains that the very first camp I entered and I peeped, I saw that there was a huge gathering of, of the leaders of various tribes. And Abu Sufyan, he was standing at the head and he was addressing them. This is what? This is Allah. And this is the help of Allah which he has promised for all the mujahideen, striving, struggling, fighting, working for the cause of jihad. So he said that I quietly sat down and I started listening to the whole proceeding. And Abu Sufyan was there. He was addressing them and he was discussing about their future plans. And Hazrat Usaifar, and who he explains that Abu Sufyan, he tried to be very overcautious and uh, he was trying to be, he planned about any Muslim spy, just taking, just sitting and just taking over all their secrets. So he asked, addressed all of them, and he asked all of them to check the entity of the person on their right and on the left, because they were all different people from different tribes, and they did not recognize each other. Being, uh, being uh, belonging to different tribes, they did not recognize each other. So Abu Sufyan suggested that every person should suggest, should uh, check on the entity of the person who's sitting on the right and on the left. Hazrat Uzefa said that I looked on my sides and I found two men about whom the words of Prophet Sallallahu echoed in my mind. And I had heard Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say, Rahiyatul Arab, Rahiyatul Arab, the wisest men of Arabs, the two men, Amir Mavia and Amar ibn al-As. And these two, Rahiyatul Arab, were sitting on my left and on my right. I was, I was upset and I said, now you'll be taken up, Uzefa. But there, there again, there was the help of Allah. Again, there was the help of Allah. And how did this help of Allah came? He said that I got, I got confident. I got away with my confidence when with all my wits, 
I slapped my hand with the person sitting on my right. And I asked him, what was his name? And he said that Amir Mavia. And then with full wits and with full confidence, I slapped my hand on the thigh of a person who was sitting on my left. And I asked him, who was he? He said, Amar ibn Ulas. But you know what happened? With the help of Allah, both of these two, Rahiyatul Arab, they were dumbfolded. And they forgot to ask about Hazrat Hosefa, and he was saved. This is what? Makaru wa makarullah. Abu Sufyan had planned that they might catch the spy, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had planned that he would save the spy. So what happened was what Allah had planned. Remember, whom Allah supports, no one hurts. Whom Allah protects, no one can harm. So when Hazrat Uzefa was there, he heard the speech of Abu Sufyan, and uh, he was what he was saying that the siege was prolonging and the siege was prolonging without any results and their livestock, they were dying of cold and their stores and their rations, they were exhausting. They were coming down rapidly. So he said that it is much better for them to retreat and then to return later on. Hazrat Uzefa getting this news, he was, he was so happy to gather this piece of information. And then he returned back safely and he came over to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And uh, there he gave him all the piece of information and the news which he had gathered from Abu Sufyan. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was also very relieved. And uh, Hazrat Uzefa says that uh, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that night he gave me his blanket. For the night he gave, Prophet Sallallahu gave me his blanket. And Hazrat Hosefa says that I never, never, ever slept better than I slept that night with the blanket of Prophet Sallallahu atop me. And then in the morning, I was woken up by Prophet Sallallahu who was sitting by my side and who was lovingly caressing my hair and who was calling out to me, Kum ya no man, that, oh, oh, you who are sleeping, get up for your morning prayers. So now what happened during the night was that there was a terrible, there was a terrible thunderstorm. And in the morning, the Muslims woke up. They, they woke up to find that the enemy had fled. And all the camps, they were uprooted. And all the belongings of the enemies, they were all scattered in the ground. This was the help of Allah. What message, what moral do we learn? It is not the number. It is not the number and the strength or the arms or the ammunition of the enemy, which is important. But what matters is actually the behavior, the behavior and the mannerism of the Muslim army is what is more important. When a group of Muslim mujahideen, when a group of Muslim sincere, sincere Muslims, however small, however weak, however empty handed they are, if they stay obedient patiently, if they are obedient to Allah and his prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they are obedient, they are patient in their, obedient, in their obedience, and they rely on the promises of Allah with full devotion and conviction, then no one can defeat them. For the rule of Allah, for his beloved is what? In Allah ma'aswabirin. The help of Allah comes and befalls those who are patient, who are obedient, and who are reliant. The help of whom? The help of he who is the master, who is the sustainer, who is the controller, who is the sovereign ruler of all, joins those who are the Swabirin, who are the Mu'mineen, who are the Muslimin, who are the Qanitin, and who have reliance in their master. Verse number nine, O you 
who have believed, remember the favor of Allah upon you when armies came to attack you and we sent upon them what? Rehan. This Rehan refers to the storm, the thunderstorm on the last night. We sent upon them a wind and armies of angels you did not see, and ever is Allah of what you do seeing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was seeing all the way they had dug the trench with all the sincerity and all the sacrifice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had helped them. Remember, when they came at you from above you and from below you, and when eyes shifted in fear and hearts reached the throats, and you assumed about Allah various assumptions. This is when the enemies, they were proceeding from the north, from the south, and from all the sides is what Allah is mentioning here. There, the believers were tested and shaken with a severe shaking. And remember, when the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is a disease, which is this hypocrisy, they said, Allah and his messenger did not promise us except delusion. And when a faction of them said, O people of Yathrib, there is no stability for you there, so return home. And a party of them asked permission of Prophet wasallam, saying, Indeed, our houses are unprotected. While they were not exposed, they did not intend except to flee. Now, what is this when the people were saying that Yasrib, there is no stability for them and that their houses were not protected? This was when a rumor spread. The rumor was that the Jews of Banu Qureza, they were planning to attack the Muslims from behind. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he ordered, he ordered that, um, I told you previously also that the Till now, the two Jew tribes, they had been exiled from Medina, but only the Jews of Banu Qureza, since they were obeying the Charter of Medina and the Treaty of Charter of Medina, so they were residing in Medina. Now, when the Jews who were attacking, the Jews of Banu Nazir and Banu Qainqa, when they attacked and they found the ditch, they were infuriated and they sent their message to the people of Banu Qureza, to the Jews of Banu Qureza, and they instigated the Jews of Banu Qureza to attack the Muslims from behind. So they agreed to the Jew brothers. And so when Prophet Sallallahu they he received the information that Jews of the Banu Qureza, they are planning to attack the Muslims uh, to support their Jew brothers from the front. Then Prophet Sallallahu ordered that the Muslim women and the Muslim children, they should be made secure in a fort of Medina. So this, this verse is actually referring to the whole situation that is being mentioned here. Now, when the children and the women folk, they were secured in a fort of Medina, what happened there was that uh, they, there was Hazrat Safiya, the maternal aunt of Prophet Sallallahu was also there. And she saw a Jew soldier. The Jew soldier had managed to sneak in the fort and she was very brave and she killed the soldier, the Jew soldier, she killed him. And then she very gallantly, she cut off the head of this Jew soldier and she threw the head over the wall. And this did what? It scared the Jews who were just going around the fortress and they thought that there was a huge army inside the fort and they just flew away. So this was the whole event when the hypocrites, they thought that the Medina was no longer safe, but actually Medina was safe. The women and the children were safe inside the fortress. And if they had been entered upon from all its surrounding regions and fitna had been demanded of them, they would have done it and not hesitated over it except briefly. And they had already promised Allah before not to turn their backs and flee. And ever is the promise to Allah that about which one will be questioned. Say, never will fleeing benefit you if you should flee from death or killing. And then if you did, 
you would not be given enjoyment of life except for a little. Say, who is it that can protect you from Allah if he intends for you an ill or intends for you a mercy and they will not find for themselves besides Allah any protector or any helper. Hasbunallah, ni'am al-mawla wa ni'am al-wakil. Already Allah knows the hinderers among you and those hypocrites who say to their brothers, come to us and do not go to the battle except for a few, indisposed towards you. And when fear comes, you see them looking at you, their eyes revolving like one being overcome by death. But when fear departs, they lash you with, your, with sharp tongues, indisposed towards any good. Those have not believed, so Allah has rendered their deeds worthless. Ever is that for Allah easy. <coughs> they think the companies have have not yet withdrawn, and if their companies should come again, they would wish they were in the desert among the Bedouins, inquiring from afar about your news. And if they should be among you, they would not fight except for a little. Now, this is this is about the behavior of the hypocrites because they were scared and they were scared to death. And this is what Allah is mentioning, that when even when the enemies had fled, they were still scared that they're going to come back or they were, they were thinking that they have not gone and they have just like hidden somewhere and they're going to retreat, they're going to come back again. So this is what Allah is mentioning about the feelings and the state of the mind of the hypocrites. There has certainly been for you in the messenger of Allah, what? لَقَدْ قَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ Certainly been for you in the messenger of Allah, an excellent pattern for anyone whose hope is in Allah and the last day and who remembers Allah often. So in this verse, Allah is explaining that Prophet Sallallahu model, his model is a model of excellence in all spheres of life. Generally, for all the followers of Prophet Sallallahu his model is the model of excellence. Prophet Sallallahu has been presented for the Ummah as what? As a human model of Quran. A human model of Quran. Actually, in all his behavior, in all his mannerism, in all his attitudes, in all his uh, worships, demonstrating, exhibiting what? a total obedience to all the orders and do's and don'ts and commandments and limits and halal and haram of Quran. So his model is what? A model of excellence, a human model for the teachings of Quran. And not only for uh, regarding this, but especially for the, for the battle of ditch also, Prophet Sallallahu presented himself as a model of excellence. And when the believers saw the companies, they said, this is what Allah and his messengers have promised us. And Allah and his messengers spoke the truth and in increased them only in faith and acceptance. Among the believers are men true to what they promised Allah. Allahumma ja'alna minhum. Among them is he who has fulfilled his vow to death and among them is he who awaits his chance. Allahumma rizukna shahadatan fi sabilik. Rabbana la taj'alna fitnatan lil qawm zwalimeen And they did not alter the terms of their commitment by any alteration that Allah may reward the truthful for their truth and punish the hypocrites, if he wills, or accepts their repentance. Indeed, Allah is ever forgiving and merciful. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatwakhireen. Rabbi ghfir wa raham wa anta khayru rahimeen. And Allah repelled those who, who disbelieved in their rage, not having obtained any good, and sufficient was Allah for the believers in battle, and ever is Allah powerful and exalted in might. 
and he brought down those who supported them among the people of scripture from their fortresses and cast terror in their hearts so that a party you killed and you took captive a party. Now, these two verses, verse 26 and verse 27, these they are mentioning the events of the expedition of Banu Koreza or the Battle of Banu Koreza. What was this all about was that the Jews of Banu Koreza, as I've already mentioned, till now they were in a treaty with the Muslims of Medina and with Prophet Sallallahu since they were abiding by the Charter of Medina, so they were residing in Medina, very much different to the Banu Nazir and Banu Kanaka who had been exiled. Now, when the enemies or the Jews, they could not attack the Muslims because of the intervening ditch, they were infuriated and they felt helpless. So what they did was that Hoyei bin Akhtab, who was the leader of the Jews in Khaybar, he contacted the Jews of Banu Koreza, who were residing in Medina, and he instigated them to break the charter. What he suggested was that the Jews of Banu Koreza, they attack the Muslims from behind, and uh, the allied forces, they will attack from front, and then they will together be successful. They will be successful to finish off the Muslims and the companions once for all. So the Banu Koreza, they agreed to the suggestions or to what Hoye bin Akhtab had asked them to do, and they started creating malice in Medina. Now, Prophet Sallallahu when he got the news, as I've already mentioned, he secured the children and the, uh, the Muslim women during uh, in the fortress and uh, uh, during the siege, the, the Medina, the, the, all these Jews, they kept on instigating and they kept on creating malice in Medina. Now, when the enemy left, after about three weeks, when the enemy left and the siege was no longer, the Muslims, the Mujahideen, they returned back to their homes in Medina. This was what? This was like after full six weeks. Three weeks was for the digging of the ditch, and three weeks was the period of, uh, of the siege. Now, after full six weeks of jihad, when they returned to Medina, what happened was that Prophet ﷺ had just returned. And he had just reached his house that has a, and he had just put down all his uh, arms that has a Jibrail alayhi salam, he arrived and he asked Prophet Sallallahu why they had set aside their arms as the angels had not. And there has a Jibrail alayhi salam, conveyed Allah's ordered uh, order to Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi to march for the expedition of Banu Quraysa to teach them a lesson for all the breach of the pact of Medina. Now, this was an order of Allah. Coming back after six weeks, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam just landing to his house in Medina and being ordered by Allah to march towards the expedition of Banu Koreza. What did Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? Obviously, is qala lahu rabbuhu aslim, qala aslam tuli rabbil alameen, or sami'na wa atwana, listening and then obedience. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam immediately there and then he announced launching and marching towards Banu Koreza. He announced the next expedition immediately there and then. And he announced that whoever of the companions was still, was still steadfast on obedience will have to march for the next expedition of Banu Koreza. What happened? How did the companions behave? remarkable obedience. There was an exhibition of a remarkable obedience was demonstrated by the companions. All of them, all of them, they had just entered their houses. They had not even rested on their beds. They had not even met their wives. They had not even greeted their mothers. They had not even hugged their children. And there was the call by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the order of Allah to march for the next military expedition, all of them, all of them came out 
Labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, labbaik, ya Rasulullah. This is the model of obedience of the companions. This is the patience and the submission which is needed by the Muslim, by the Muslims. This is what we need to remember. And this is the manner we need to adopt in our lives. The purpose of narrating all the events is <coughs> the purpose of narrating all the events is not just narrating stories or not just narrating events, but for all of us to learn, to learn this behavior of sami'na wa atwana, to be a Muslim, to be a Mormon, to surrender, to submit under all conditions, under all situations, in all scenarios for all orders and commandments of Allah. Now what happened when there was such a remarkable obedience, there was such a remarkable patience and reliance, what happened? The army reached, it encircled the fortress of Banu Qureza. And you know what the condition of the Jews was? The Jews of Banu Qureza, they had plenty of arms. They had plenty of arms and they had huge stores of rations in their go-downs. There were supplies for like months. And so what, what was the condition? They were strong. They were equipped to fight the Muslims. And otherwise, if they had not fought, they could, they could have sustained the siege for, for a longer period, for a very long period, for a period which was obviously too long for the Muslims to sustain the siege. The Muslims could not stand the siege for such a long period as the Jews. They had so much of rations and provisions in their fortresses that they could sustain the siege for a very long period, which the Muslims could not maintain. But what happened was Allah's help came like what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instilled the fear of Muslim forces in their hearts, in the hearts of the Jews of Banu Qureza. So they simply surrendered without any combat, without any fighting, without any resisting, they simply surrendered. And the Muslims, they got what? The Muslims, they got the reward of jihad. They got the reward of obedience of Allah. They got the reward of the patience and reliance. And at the same time, they also got a huge amount of booty also they received. Now, after the conquest of this uh, battle of Banu Qureza, Prophet Sallallahu had to make the decision how were the people of the Jews of Banu Qureza they were to be dealt with. Now, he, the Banu Qureza, they, uh, Prophet Sallallahu asked them that how should they be dealt with. So what the people of Banu Qureza, what did they have to say was that they asked that they wanted Hazrat Saad bin Maaz to arbitrate and to judge for them. Why did they ask for this was that before the advent of Islam and before the migration of Prophet Salavaris into Medina, Banu Qureza, the people of the tribe of Banu Qureza, they had been allies to the people of Os. Banu Qureza had been allies to the tribe of Os. So now they thought and they assumed that Hazasad bin Maaz, who was the leader of Os, will be slightly sympathetic towards them. And he might have a soft corner for them and will give them a lenient decision in favor of them. So they said they requested Prophet Sallallahu to ask Qazasad bin Maaz to arbitrate and to make, the to make the decision and judgment according to their own Torah or according to the laws of the Old Testament. So Prophet Sallallahu he asked Hazasad Raziallahu Ta'ala and who to come over and to make their decision. And I've already mentioned that Hazasad bin Maaz Raziallahu Ta'ala and who had been very seriously injured. His uh, main vessel of the leg had been uh, had been pierced by the arrow which had uh, been thrown by the enemies. And um, he was very seriously injured and he had bled profusely. But despite the fact when he was summoned by Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he and his family, none of them refused. And immediately was he brought over to the place of uh, the tribe of Banu Qureza. 
and according to the order of uh, the the law of uh, the old testament has uh, saad bin maaz made a decision and the decision was obviously the judge uh, the fair decision according to their own law which they had asked for themselves and what the decision he made was that all the men folk would be put to sword and the women and the children they would be captive away they would they would be taken as captives and they would be made as slaves and all the belongings of the people of banu qurayza they would be taken over by the muslims this was a fair decision and this was according to what they had asked for themselves the person they had asked for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has provided had provided him and the book and the law they had asked for the decision was made according to that so it was a totally fair decision as they had asked for and he caused you to inherit their land and their homes and their properties and a land which you have not trodden and ever is allah over all things competent o prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam say to your wives if you should desire the worldly life and its adornments then come i will provide for you and give you a gracious release now the background of this verse is a happening in the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what happened was that after the battle of the ditch and after the battle of banu qurayza the muslims they received a lot of booty and we do uh, we have learned from the verses of surah al anfal that the booty was to be divided by the orders of allah one fifth of the booty was to be kept for lillahi wa rasulihi was for allah and was for the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so half of this one fifth of the booty was which was the share of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was equally divided between the wives of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam for their economic requirements and for their um, for their day to day uh, economic commitments because obviously prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had no time for any earning for the family and for his wives so now when this booty arrived and there was so plentiful of booty what happened was that the women of the hypocrites who uh, obviously they were they were mixing up and they were visiting and interacting with ummahatul mu'minin they somehow suggested the ummahatul mu'minin that they should demand an increase in their share to make them economically comfortable this was what this was a suggestion which was given to the ummahatul mu'minin by the hypocrite women and uh, so motivated by the suggestion the ummahatul mu'minin they asked prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to increase their share now this event has been narrated by hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who himself when he says that uh, one day hazrat abu bakr and myself we walked into prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam's courtyard where he was sitting with his wives around him at that time we know that there were four wives Hazrat Sauda, Hazrat Aisha, Hazrat Hafsa, and Hazrat Salma رضي الله تعالى أم سلم أم سلم رضي الله تعالى عنها all of them and uh, two of them were obviously the daughters of Hazrat Abu uh, Abu Bakr and Hazrat Umar رضي الله تعالى when Hazrat Umar says that uh, when we arrived Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم he was sitting there he was silent and he it seemed as if he was upset seeing both of us he said what he said that look they are asking me to increase increase their um, their um, their share of the booty and their pocket money hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who was furious and he scolded hazrat hafsa radhiyallahu ta'ala anha and he told her very aggressively and clearly that uh, never to make demands from prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam in future and he told her that if she needed anything she should ask him that is hazrat umar radhiyallahu ta'ala and who in future now following this event there was another event what i shall be talking about inshallah in the succeeding chapters so finally for the sake of because of these two successive events finally for the sake of training the ummahatul mu'minin prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam vowed that he would stay away from them for a month this was what this was an ila an ila for a period of one month was made by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
and making this ila, he shifted to the upper apartment all by himself. Now, after Prophet ﷺ had done this, a rumor spread in Medina that Prophet ﷺ had divorced his wives. Now, when the news got to Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala, who he was extremely upset, and he quickly came over to Masjid Nabi. He asked permission to meet Prophet Sallallahu Twice he was refused, and he was granted permission for the third time. And he went upstairs, and there he saw that Prophet Sallallahu was all by himself in the apartment. And there was barely anything around him. And there were also marks of the ropes of his bed on his naked back. And Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he saw this state of affairs, he had tears in his eyes. And he said that, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi you in this condition? You in this condition? And Kaiser and Kisra, that is the kings and the rulers of Persia and of the Romans, they live in luxuries. And then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he addressed Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, and he said that, Umar, don't we want that the luxuries of this world be for them and the hereafter be for us? And then Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says that he asked Prophet Sallallahu whether he had divorced his wives. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu told him that he had vowed for Ila and he had not divorced them. And he had just made Ila for a month. And then Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he came out and he announced the actual condition and all the companions, they were relieved, and Takbir was called out to rejoice. And uh, then Prophet ﷺ, he came down on the 29th day, and there was his beloved wife, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala, and she was standing there, and she asked Prophet ﷺ that why he had come down before the completion of a month. And in a very loving manner, Prophet ﷺ answered that Aisha, some months, they... They are, um, they, com they are completed within 29 days or so. And then these two verses of um, the, and the verses, these verses of uh, Surah Ahzab, they were revealed. And in these verses, Prophet Sallallahu suggested takhayyur to his wives. And these verses of takhir were revealed. And uh, the mothers of believers, they were given the choice and they were given the right of divorce in these two verses. And after these two verses were revealed, we learned that uh, Prophet ﷺ came to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and, her, and uh, he told her that uh, he was going to ask her something which she should not answer in haste. And uh, Prophet ﷺ also advised her to consult her parents also and uh, should think over and consult her parents before she answered him. And then he recited these two verses. But Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her, she was so sure-headed. She was so sure-headed about what she wanted that and about her options that she spontaneously, she had no other choice but to opt living with Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the uh, same was repeated by the rest of the wives also. And all of them, they had the same answer. And uh, uh, from these verses, we do get an idea that we learn from here that giving the right of divorce to the wife is permissible and it is pre precedented in Islam. So now I'll be going to the verses again. Allah says, O Prophet, وسلم, say to your wives, if you should desire the worldly life and its adornments, then come, I will provide for you and give you a gracious release. But if you should desire Allah and his messenger and the home of hereafter, then indeed Allah has prepared for the doers of good among you a great reward. So here, is uh, the option of uh, the right of divorce, which was extended to the wives of Prophet Sallallahu And both all the wives, uh, they preferred to stay with Prophet Sallallahu and uh, carry on in his nikah. Number 30. Ya Nisa an Mayakti. Min kunna bifarhishatim mubayinatim yuzar aflah al adabu zirfain. 
O wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whoever of you should commit a clear immorality for her, the punishment will be doubled twofold, and ever is that for Allah easy. And whoever of you devoutly obeys Allah and his messenger and does righteousness, we will give her her reward twice. And we have prepared for her noble provision. So in these verses 30 and 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned double punishment and double reward for the Ummahatul Mu'mineen because they were and they are the role models for all the Muslim women of the Ummah. Verse number 32. Ya Nisa an-Nabihi lastunnaka ahadim minan nisai in it taqaytunna fala tahswana bil kauli fayat maalazi fi kolbihi marazuwa kulna kaula marufa. O wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you are not like anyone among women. If you fear Allah, then do not be soft in speech to men, lest he in whose heart is a disease should covet, but speak with appropriate speech. Now this verse is addressing and giving an order basically to the Umahatul Mu'mineen, but indirectly is ordering the manner and the conduct of interaction and conversation of Muslim women with non-Muslim, uh, with non-Mehram men. The first thing which we can gather from here is that the verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is instructing about the mannerism of interaction between Muslim men and Muslim women, the non-Mehram Muslim men is, it implies what? That this interaction when and where needed is prohibit, is permissible. It is permissible and it is not prohibited because the manner of action is only told if it is permissible, if it had not been permissible, if it had been prohibited, then obviously the manner would not have been explained. So Muslim women here are being instructed that in order to prevent any wrong desires in the hearts of men, they are interacting with, they need to talk in a manner like what? Fala taqswa'na that do not talk softly or do not talk in a low, soft tone or a soft speech. This is a don't. And do what? If you are interacting in time of need, do what? Qulna qawlam ma'rufa. Appropriate, respectable speech. And so there are there is a do and there is a don't. For the speech, meaning that it means and it is ordering all of us Muslim women what? That they should not converse in an extra soft, extremely polite, loving, or like a seducing tone. Like sometimes you, you do see that women who are in the, in the job of an air hostesses or waitresses, receptionists, secretaries, or anchor persons of certain programs, all these ladies, they are trained to talk in that manner. All the Muslim women of the Ummah, they are being told not, and they've been instructed in clear-cut words not to talk in that extra polite, loving, and a seducive tone. Moreover, the uh, all the women, they are also the conversation which we should make should be clear-cut. It should be to the point, nothing extra, and no topic uh, should be beyond the need. And the topics also should be very, very modest. And even more important, I think we would need to be mindful about the facial expressions and the body language. That is the gestures of the body itself. The style of the speech is also very important. The topic of the speech, the style of the speech, and the manner of the speech. All things we have to, women folk have to be mindful. There should be no, moreover, there should be no bad or harsh manners also. 
and do what Allah says in verse number 33 Allah says Allah <laughs> إنما يريد الله ليذهب أنقم الرزا أهل البيت ويطهركم تطهيرا. وذكرنا ما يطلع في بيوت كنا من آيات الله والحكمة إن الله كان لطيفا خبيرا. So now in these two verses, 33 and 34, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving a very important line of action to all the Muslim women of Muslim ummah. To, the purpose is to remove impurity, the sins of impurity to be removed from the Muslim women and from the Muslim society also for the purification of the Muslim society and for keeping the Muslim women pure and pious. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving certain specific commandments for the Muslim women of a Muslim society. And the purpose is to eradicate all immorality and to create a modest Islamic environment in the society. This is why, because we know that women themselves and the beauty of the women is what? It is attractive. It is, it is attractive. It is a tempting thing. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Imran, So where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions women and nisa, they come, they come top of the list. So to save the people and the Muslim men of the society from the seductive temptation, the women folk of the Muslim society, they are being given categorical, clear-cut orders. And the first is, وَكَرْنَ فِي بَيُوتِ kunna. Fakarna is from Karora and from Bakar. It means what? That Allah is ordering all the Muslim women to reside, to abide, to stay within to stay with their honor, with their respect, peacefully, comfortably within the protective, within the protected, comfortable limits of their homes, which they have been blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah in Quran and Hadith has enforced no social commitments. Remember, it is very clear cut that Allah in Quran and Allah in Hadith has enforced no social economic commitments on the Muslim women in any relationship. Or may it be the mother, the daughter, the sister, the wife, in no relationship does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put any economic obligations on a Muslim woman. On the contrary, the responsibility of a Muslim woman has been totally enjoined upon the men around her. May they be the father, the brother, the husband, or the son. So Allah here is ordering the Muslim women that the main and the basic circle, the main and the basic circle of activity and duty of the Muslim women is their own house, where by the order of Allah, all your requirements and needs have been kindly and graciously attended to. So as princesses of your father's home and as queens of your husband's residence, you reside contented and peacefully within your house. Remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has declared the husband and wife as what? As Allah has said in Surah Nisa, Khalaka minha zawjaha. The husband and wife are zawj and zawj is a peer. They are both parallel in a pair, both the things are parallel, equal, and moreover, they are dependent on each other. So the husband and wife being a pair, being a zodge, they are parallel, they are equal, and they are dependent on each other to smoothly and efficiently run the establishment of their house. But because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the men and the women both physically, emotionally, psychologically, They've been created differently. Their circles of commitments and duties are also different. Male, men, 
they are strong, they are hardy, they are tough, they are resilient. So their circle is outside the house, fending, fetching, providing, arranging for all the economic resources, and that's it. So their circle, their duties, and their commitments is outside the house. The women, they have been created, they have been made, they are soft, they are loving, they are caring. So their circle is basically within the house. So in the house where they can provide a loving and a caring, rearing and training the young children and also looking after the old, weak, debilitated parents. So this is what here in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Muslim women, that you peacefully, with honor, with respect, with regard, stay content, reside in the houses where you've been provided all your basic necessities and amenities of your life. You've been provided with the respect, with the regard, and with all your basic necessities of your life. So you reside comfortably and peacefully within your houses where your duties are, where your commitments are, where people around you have rights upon you. But remember, this by no means implies that the Muslim women, they have, been in, they have been encaged in a golden cage. Or they have been, they have been ordered to be kept under lock and key. Or they're just not allowed, or they're not supposed to go out. No, it doesn't imply anything of the sort. Because we do learn that the wives, the daughters of Prophet Sallallahu and even the companions, they did go out even in the expeditions with Prophet Sallallahu even with armies. We see Hazrat Umm Amara, we see so many other companions. They, they used to provide first aid to the, to the injured soldiers, and they used to provide water to the Mujahideen of the army. Hazrat Umm Amara, anha, the lady of Uhud, she, she had joined Prophet Sallallahu army with, with her husband and with her son, Hazrat Abdullah, and when she found out that Prophet has been left all by himself and he's not protected, so she jumped into the battlefield. She left over all what she was doing previously and she called her son Abdullah and she jumped into the battlefield, protecting Prophet from all around. And Prophet did what? He approved and he appraised his command to us. After Uhud, he said what? Brothers, Umm Amara, she took the lead. I would see on my right, on my left, in front of me, behind me, all around me was Umm Amara and Umm Amara. She took the lead. So Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not, did not condemn her being there. So it is permissible. Similarly, we do learn that wives of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would accompany him when he left Medina. Hazrat Layla Ghaffariya, she was... She was a companion in the life of Prophet Sallallahu and she did surgeries. Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, the first and the beloved wife of Prophet Sallallahu was one of the most successful businesswomen in, in Makkah. And Prophet Sallallahu used to used to say that teach Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, teach her mathematics and teach her medical sciences. So it is permissible it is permissible for Muslim women to leave their houses, but Allah has explained that and enjoined that the basic circle of duties of a Muslim wife is within their houses. So after fulfilling their duties, if they have free time and if they still have energy, if they have time and if they have energy after completing their basic duties of their house, then without transgressing the limits of Allah, they can go out of their houses. So these limits of Allah, they will be taught in the next few verses, inshallah. So the first limit is what? That it is the basic duty is your house, your children. But after fulfilling your duties, after paying off their rights, if you have the time and energy, then you can leave with a proper charter within the limits of Allah, you can leave your house. And what is the first limit which Allah says here? Do what? Allah says when you leave your house, that do not do what? This is the first don't. 
This is Allah, Allah of Quran, Allah which is similar to the law, wala tushriku bihi shayya, for the worshipping of idols, a similar law for the orders of Quran for murder, for zina, for for any of the sins where Allah says Allah, it is a similar law for all the Muslim women of the ummah, wala tabarrajna. That do what? This is a special order for the Muslim women. Barajin means what? It means it means something which is prominent, which is highlighted, which is catchy, which is flashy, and which is attractive. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering the Muslim women that when you leave your homes in need, in necessity, then do not adopt any form of behavior or thing which makes you prominent. Anything which makes you prominent, which makes you catchy, which makes you flashy, which makes you attractive, and which highlights your being around, do not adopt any, any form of that form of adornment. May it be your dress, jewelry, makeups, perfumes, jingle of your ornaments, the style of your walk, your talking, your gestures, your actions, any of these which make you prominent, attractive, or catchy, do not adopt that. Muslim women have been, have been told to avoid this behavior, as Allah says, that this is a manner of what? Jahiliyatil ula. This is a manner of the period of ignorance. It was the women, it was the women, it were the women of period of ignorance who used to go about exhibiting and demonstrating their adornments in the society, attracting, attracting men towards them. So this is a manner of the women of period of ignorance. So according to the verse, you know, if we all need to get modern and we need to get refined and polished, we need to conceal our adornments and avoid all forms of making ourselves prominent, attractive, and catchy. But if you talk about today's society, we do know that the more prominent, the more highlighted, the more attractive and catchy and flashy a woman is, the more she displays, the more she reveals her figure, her body, her dress, her beauty, her hairstyle, the more she is considered modern and successful and refined and polished. And in our societies of today, the women who conceal, the women who conceal and who avoid displaying their beauty and their figure in public, the society labels them as old fashioned. The society starts calling them outdated and obsolete. They are labeled as orthodox and fanatics. We need to remember that generally the merits of Quran and merits of majority of the society, they, they tend to oppose each other. And they generally, they seriously, they clash with one another. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, help us, help us set our priorities and merits according to the merits taught by Quran and Hadith. And in the next part of the verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when that when you don't have to do what? When you go outdoors and when you have to save yourself from tabaruj, you start doing what? Wa salat. That when, firstly, you need to stay indoors. What do you do when you stay indoors to prevent yourself from doing tabaruj? What do you do? You have free time. You have free energy. How do you utilize it all? Because you know the free mind is what? It is a devil's workshop. So if if you are not indulging in tabarruj and you you are you are supposed to basically stay indoors then to save yourself from tabarruj and to do save yourself from indulging in negative activities with with the time and with the energy free now that you have what do you do you do what allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes up with the first order akimna salata that you establish your salah Establish your salah to stop yourself as a deterrent from tabaruj and the activities in the house is a kimna salat. It is a special order for the Muslim women. And this is exactly 
where establishing of Salah will be a deterrent for tabaruj and for exhibition and demonstration for all forms of adornments. As Allah says in Quran, inna salata tanha anil fakshai wal munkar. That Salah itself will be a deterrent from all forms of immorality. And then Salah itself will make you modest and pious Muslim women. And then after that, do what? Wa'atina zakata. You spend, you spend zakat and you spend in the path of Allah. How will this help? Because you remember that once a person starts spreading, spending in the path of Allah, the contentment, the contentment the person gets by feeding a hungry person or helping a deprived person will get the person in the habit of charity. And once the person gets into the habit of charity, this will definitely leave less spare budget for tabaruj and for display and for all forms of exhibition of adornments. And the next thing Allah says, then obey Allah and Prophet Sallallahu Now this will do what? This will guide, this will guide to spend the life according to the limits prescribed by Allah and the boundaries set by hadith. And then do what? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Recite and remember the verses of Quran. This will be what? This will be again a potent and a continuous reminder of the fear of hereafter, of the commandments, do's and don'ts of Allah, of the limits of Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made all this mandatory. Why? Allah says, لِيُذْحَبَ أَنْكُمُ الرِّزَّ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ أَحْلَ الْبَيْتِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the Ummahatul Mu'mineen as Ahlul Bayt. And Allah is saying here that for keeping the Ummahatul Mu'mineen pious and pure, and for keeping the environment of the apartments of the mothers of believers purified, these steps are needed. All this has been mentioned and it has been made obligatory and mandatory for the purification for the houses of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Really, these steps are needed. These steps are needed for the purification of the homes of Ummahatul Mu'mineen. So what about our houses, our society? Charter for purification of the Muslim community and homes is what is these two verses. The women folk, they will mainly stay indoors. They will mainly stay indoors. Wakarna fi attending to their domestic commitments, attending to their duties as Muslim wives, as Muslim mothers, as daughters, as sisters. And when they're going to come outdoors, they will refrain from display of any form of adornments, of any form of things which are make, going to make them catchy and attractive. And then the Muslim women are going to establish salah. They're going to pay zakat and spend in the path of Allah. And they're going to stay connected to the verses of Quran. So these are the points which are needed to keep the Muslim women pious and pure and to keep the Muslim society pure and clean from all forms of immoralities and from all forms of, and to keep the Muslim society a pure, modest Islamic society. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us remember and help us adopt all these. And remember what is recited in your houses of the verses of Allah and wisdom. And indeed, Allah is subtle and acquainted with all the things. Verse number 35. Now in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the series of traits for the Muslim men and for the women. Allah says, Innal muslimina wal muslimat, wal mu'minina wal mu'minat. وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ وَالصَّابِرِينَ وَالصَّابِرَاتِ 
wal khashi'ina wal khashi'ati wal mutasaddiqina wal mutasaddiqati was sa'imina was sa'imati wal hafizina farujahum wal hafizati wal dhaqirina allaha qasiran wal dhaqirati a'addallahu lahum maghfiratun wa ajran azima Allah says indeed the muslim men and the muslim women the believing men and the believing women the obedient men and the obedient women the truthful men and the truthful women the patient men and the patient women the humble men and the humble women the charitable men and the charitable women the fasting men and the fasting women the men who guard their private paths and the women who do so and the men who remember allah often and the women who do so for them allah for them allah has prepared forgiveness and a great reward so here are the traits whom allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the great reward they are al muslimina wal muslimat are those who believe in allah in quran and in prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam they are al mu'minin al mu'minat who after believing do what they not only believe in they act on the teachings of allah quran and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and how do they obey they are al qanitin wal qanitat they are obedient and how are they obedient allah says waswadiqina waswadiqat they believe and they act on the truth from allah and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and while they are obeying they do what aswabirina waswabirat during obeying the truth they do what and how do they react they are patient men and patient women and why do they stay patient is al khashiina wal khashiyat they are humbled and they fear they fear here after that is why they fear they are the fearing god fearing men and the god fearing women and they are humble men and humble women and why do they fear allah and why do they fear here after what do they do when they fear allah and they fear here after al mutasaddiqina wal mutasaddiqat they spend charity they want to barter for here after that is why they spend and what else do they do they are fasting men aswaimina waswaimat and what do they do beyond this wal hafizina farujahum they they are chaste they are modest and they they guard their private paths and above all they are what was zaqirina allah qasira wa zaqirat because allah has said wal zikrullah akbar that the greatest deed which allah likes the best deed the deed of excellence is the remembrance of allah so they remember allah prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was asked by his companions they said and they asked that we all fast who out of all of us will have the maximum reward and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said the one who does the maximum of remembrance of allah and then they asked that we all perform hajj who will be rewarded with the greatest of reward and he said that who remembers allah the most and then they asked that we all do jihad who will be rewarded with the maximum reward of jihad and prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam again answered the mujahid who remembers allah the most there is the heart the heart is remembering allah and the tongue is supple with the remembrance of allah with the glorification of allah with the exaltations of allah and with the remembrance of allah for them allah mentions what ajran azima allah promises the greatest reward the greatest reward ajran azima is being promised by whom who is allahu akbar who is allahu akbar the greatest controller the greatest lord how great will be the great reward of the greatest allah the great reward is what is jannah which no eye has seen no ear has heard and no heart can feel rabb ibni li aindaka baitan fil jannah it is not for a believing man or a believing woman that when allah and his messenger have decided a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair and whoever disobeys allah and his messenger has certainly strayed into clear error now allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after explaining 
the basic characteristics and traits of Muslimina and Muslimat. Now here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is narrating an experience uh, uh, happening in the life of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The background of the revolution of these verses is the nikah of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam with Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. By the order of Allah, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent proposal of his adopted son, Hazrat Zaid bin Haris radiallahu ta'ala anhu, for his paternal cousin, Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Since Hazrat Zaid radiallahu ta'ala anha anhu was a slave, and he was from the, she herself, as Zainab bin Jahash, she was from the family of the leaders of Quraysh. So immediately the family simply refused. The family simply refused, but Hazrat Zainab bin Tajahash Allah Ta'ala Anha, on top of that, also added the reason why she was refusing the, this, uh, this message of Nikah. And she said, Ana khairum min nasaba, that I am better than him in caste and family. This was what? This was an arrogance an arrogance of her family origin, of her family, of her caste, of her origin. And um, although we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned in Surah Nisa, that Ya yuhanna su'abadu rabbakum, rabbakum ullazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida, wa khalaka minha zawjaha. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has also elaborated. He said that no Arab has any superiority over a non-Arab and no white has any superiority over a black, and you are all the sons of Adam alayhi salam. So when the proposal was rejected, it was rejected by the family, and the reason of rejection was explained by Hazrat Zainab bin the Jahash radiallahu ta'ala anha, then these verses were revealed. And what did Allah say? Let's read again. That it is not for a believing man or a believing woman that when Allah and his messenger have decided a matter that they should thereafter have any choice about their affair. And whoever disobeys Allah and his messenger has certainly strayed into clear error. So now in this verse, it was clearly announced that after receiving the orders of Allah and the orders of Prophet Wasallam, the believers have no choice but to obey but to surrender, to submit to the orders of Allah. Because this is what Islam is. What is Islam? Islam is actually submission. This is what a Muslim is. A Muslim is the one who what? Who does what? Who surrenders. And this is what a believer is supposed to do. What is a believer supposed to do? That whether he likes or he dislikes, he finds it easy or he finds it difficult. And there is an order of Quran. There is, there is only choice. There's only one choice. There is not but to do and die. The person has to obey. When the person recites la ilaha illallah, then the person has to surrender, has to submit, has to obey the orders, the do's, the don'ts, the commandments, the obligations of Quran has to have to be obeyed by the believers, by the Muslims. This is it. So the manner of the companions was when there was a verse which was revealed, they just not, they just did not recite the verse. They used to read the verse as Allah mentions himself, uh, himself in the Quran. He says, When they, they found a verse, they would read the verse, they would recite the verse, and then they would analyze the message of the verse. And they would, they would analyze their own conduct and the self-analysis they would make to judge what they were, they were doing with reference to this verse, what they were up to in this context, what their behavior was regarding this, where did they stand? And when doing this self-analysis as compared to the order of that verse, if they found or they identified any deficit, they would, they would regret, repent, seek forgiveness, and they would alter their behaviors according to what the worst was ordering them to do. 
So now what happened was then when Hazrat Zainab bin the Jahash radiallahu ta'ala and how she refused and she also gave a, a reason for her refusal. But after some time, this verse was revealed. She, when she received the verse, she realized that she had not submitted. She had not submitted and surrendered to the order of Allah and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So she realized that by refusing the proposal, she had not submitted and surrendered. So she, she regretted, she repented, and she accepted the proposal. And she agreed to marry Hazrat Zaid radiallahu ta'ala anha. This was not an easy job. We need to analyze lady of her stature, her position, her family, marrying a poor slave, what criticism she would have to face? What would the friends and the family say? What would the family and the tribe think? How would she go through? How would she go through all the social economic repercussions? How will the mental social economic gap, how will she fill it up? And then there was much, much more. Shaitan must have positively suggested all this. But she had read the verse which said, وَمَنْ يَقْسِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ وَمَنْ يَقْسِ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ That whoever had disobeyed Allah and his messenger would be what? Would, would certainly stray into clear error. So this was sufficient and she obeyed. What a remarkable role model has she sent, she set for all the daughters of the Ummah. This is the remarkable role model. And this role model we are going through before we read the orders of Surah Ahzab, the orders of Parda in the last Ruku. And what we learn is that whatever order of Quran, May it be the orders of Surah Baqarah. May it be the orders of Surah Noor. May it be the orders which we are going to read in Surah Ahzab. Whatever the do's and don'ts of Quran, which we've already discussed in the previous earth. Whatever the orders of Quran, however difficult it seems to obey them. Whatever social, psychological, emotional, economic crises might crop up after obeying these orders and commandments, we have to but obey. We have to but follow the teachings and commandments of Quran and Hadith. What is obligatory is obligatory. There is no no about it. Samirna wa atwana is the only option we as Muslim women have to surrender, to submit, to obey, and to stay patient, and to stay steadfast in the obedience to all these orders we do read and do find in the messages, in the verses of Allah. And remember, when you said to one of, one on whom Allah has bestowed favor, and you bestowed favor, Keep your wife and fear Allah while you conceal within yourself that which Allah is to disclose. And you fear the people while Allah has more right that you fear him. So when Zaid had no longer any need for her, whom as Zainab bin Tijahash, we married her to you in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them and ever is the command of Allah accomplished. Now, here in this verse, the background is regarding the marital misunderstanding between Hazrat Zaid radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. The relationship, the marital relationship did not work up. And so when it was not working up, Hazrat Zaid radiallahu ta'ala and who he came to Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to get his advice before he divorced Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and who because it was a routine of all the companions that before they made any decision in their life, 
they would counsel, they would ask and take Prophet Sallallahu advice. So before giving a divorce to Hazrat Zainab Razillahu Ta'ala and Ha, he came to take advice of Prophet Sallallahu Now, in this situation, we need to analyze that why did this marital relationship end up in this situation? Why did it reach this stage of breaking up? You know why? Because of the superiority complex, the slight superiority complex, the feeling of being one up, it still persisted to some extent in Hazrat Zainab Ta'ala and Ha's mind. So because of this frame of mind, she did not, she could not accept the supremacy of Hazrat Zaid Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu as her husband. And the order of Quran is what? So this order of Quran was not being followed precisely by the wife in this situation. And so the disaster happened. So the disaster happened when this golden law of Quran was not being accepted by a wife as pious as Hazrat Zainab Razillahu Ta'ala Anha. The disaster of divorce happened. Remember, remember that the order of Quran, all the orders of Quran are such golden rules that skipping or omitting just one would definitely leave its repercussions and consequences. And adopting even one would create the advantages also. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Make us all of them who do what? Utkhulu fi silmi kafa. Enter completely into, into Islam and obey all the teachings and commandments of Islam and Quran and reach and accept and receive all the blessings of obedience. Now, Hazrat Zayd bin Haris was Yallahu ta'ala and who he did not accept. Hazrat Zainaz was Yallahu ta'ala and her, she was not accepting the golden principle of Quran completely. So the bond did not flourish. And the relationship ended. I would want to highlight here that if the marital bond of such pious companions, one is Hazrat Zaid Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu, who is the only, who is the sole companion of Prophet Sallallahu whose name has been mentioned in Quran, and who was who was the adopted son of Prophet Sallallahu who was his beloved adopted son, and the second is whom? Who is Ummul Mu'mineen, Hazrat Zainab Razillahu Ta'ala Anha, the mother of believers? Between these two pious people, the bond, the marital bond did not flourish, did not grow, and did not continue. When? When Ar-Rajalu Qawwamuna Ala Nisai was not obeyed completely. So we all need to think then, will the marital bonds of today? The marital bonds of today's husbands and wives, will they last? Will they grow? Will they flourish if this principle is not adopted? Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa zurriyatina qurrata ayunin wa ja'alna lil muttaqina imama. So now when Hazrat Zaid Razillahu ta'ala and who he came to Prophet Sallallahu for advice, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised what? He said, keep your wife and fear Allah. That is, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam advised Hazrat Zaid Razillahu Ta'ala Anhu against divorce. Why was this? It was not just because divorce is disliked in the, light, in the sight of Allah. This was, there was something else behind. This was because Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had been already been informed about this the happening of this divorce through a revelation. He had already been, he had been informed about the happening of this divorce previously. And at the same time, he had also been ordered that after the divorce of the two, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will have to marry Hazrat Zainab Razillahu Ta'ala Anha. For Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this order of marrying Hazrat Zainab bint Jahash radiyallahu ta'ala anha was extremely difficult. Why? Because he knew that there would be a storm of opposition from all the sides. 
Christians, because in Christians, they, they do not allow cousin marriages, so they would criticize, the people of the book would criticize. In the custom of Arabs, the adopted son, for all facts and purposes, was considered like the real son, and so they did not allow marrying the wife of the adopting son like the real daughter-in-law. So this was totally against the Arab custom also. And then there would be opposition from the hypocrites also. Because already Prophet Sallallahu had four wives. And in Surah Nisa, we know that Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has permitted Muslim, women, Muslim men to have four wives and not more than that. So now if Prophet Sallallahu after his previous four wives would make nikah with the Zainab bint Jahash radiyallahu ta'ala anha, she would be the fifth wife. And this would be exceeding the order of Allah. And moreover, the hypocrites would also get a chance to criticize Na'uzu Billah, Prophet Sallallahu saying that he had Na'uzu Billah fallen for his daughter-in-law. And he had caused the marriage to break so that he could marry the wife of his adopted son. So criticism from all the sides, from the people of the book, from all forms of Arab customs and from the hypocrites, he was foreseeing all these criticisms. So his marriage, opposing so many customs and so many social norms, he wanted to avoid it. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala checked, checked on the Prophet sallallahu and told him the wisdom of carrying out this marriage. Prophet sallallahu said what? Let's read the verse again. When he came, he asked, uh, Prophet sallallahu said, keep your wife and fear Allah. Why Allah now comments on the state of affairs and state of mind of Prophet sallallahu says, while you conceal within yourself that which Allah is to disclose, and you fear the people while Allah has more right than you fear him. So this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is checking directly Prophet sallallahu in his state of affairs and his state of mind. So when Zayd had no longer any need for her, we married her to you in order. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this part of the verse is explaining the reason why Prophet sallallahu was asked to marry Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, we married her to you in order that there not be upon the believers any discomfort concerning the wives of their adopted sons when they no longer have need of them. And ever is the command of Allah accomplished. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him the wisdom of carrying out this marriage was basically to negate, to negate and to eradicate all the false matrimonial customs of the Christians, of uh, the Arabs, and to prove the correct manner by the actual sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So hence, after the divorce, by the order of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent proposal to Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, and uh, it is reported in traditions that uh, when uh, the when Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and how she received uh, Prophet sallallahu proposal, she was kneading. She was kneading her dough. And when she received the proposal, she did not answer spontaneously. She got up and she did istikhara. And then when she received Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's in, uh, indication, to accept the proposal, she accepted the proposal, and with the order of Allah, Wakana Amrullahi Mafula, the nikah ceremony between Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and her and Prophet was um, carried on, and then she was entered into the apartments of Prophet. Verse number forty. محمد أبا أحد من رجالكم ولكن رسول الله وخاتم النبيين وكان الله بكل شيء أليما. Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam is not the father of any one of your men, but he is the messenger of Allah and the last of the prophets. And ever is Allah of all things knowing. In this verse, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained that Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had no male issues. The children of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were from his beloved wife, the first wife of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. Uh, she had two sons, Hazrat Qasim, with reference to whom Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was called as Abu Qasim, and uh, then Hazrat Abdullah. And three daughters, Hazrat Zainab, Hazrat Ruqayya, Hazrat Umm Kulsum, and then the last, the fourth, Hazrat Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And uh, another, the last son of Prophet sallallahu was from Hazrat Maria Qiptia, radiallahu ta'ala anha, Hazrat Ibrahim. But all the sons, they passed away in childhood. And that is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned here in this verse, that he had no alive male issues. And uh, all his progenies were from his daughters. And uh, it has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Sallallahu said, La takrihul banati, inni apul banat, that don't you dislike daughters because I am the father of daughters. But you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is all merciful when he deprives of something, he blesses in something else also. So that is exactly what is being mentioned here, that Prophet Sallallahu was not blessed by any live male issue, no sons, but he was blessed with prophethood. And not only with that, he was what? He was the seal of prophets. That is, he was the last of all the prophets and apostles of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. There would be no prophet, no messenger after Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There would be no person on Allah's earth after Prophet Sallallahu to whom Hazrat Ibrahim salam, would bring revelation or to whom would be given a divine scripture or a holy book. So this is the concept of the seal of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Khatama means what? He's been called as Khatimun Nabiyyin. So Khatama means to put a seal, to close, to be free after bringing something to completion, like as um, it is called in in, a, the, in a Arabic conversation, they say as khatamul amal. It means that somebody has finished the work. Khatamul ana. It means to close or to seal the mouth of any utensil so that nothing should go in or nothing should come out. Similarly, khatamul kitab means to close the letter, to seal it so as to make it secure. And once a, a parcel or once a letter is sealed, what happens it? What is inside doesn't come out and what is outside can't, cannot just go in. And then we uh, go, uh, we read the term of khatamul qalb in Quran, which means that the heart is sealed so that neither does anything, no, the person understand anything, nor forget anything which the person already has learned. So this is what, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has called Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as khatamul anbiya, that there will be no prophet after Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this uh, message of the Quran, this verse of the Quran has been, um, there, there are many other traditions of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also regarding the finality of prophethood. As has been reported in Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the children of Israel were guided by the prophets and when a prophet died, another succeeded him. However, there will be no prophet after me. There will be only caliphs. Similarly, it has been reported in uh, Bukhari that Prophet ﷺ said that my position in relation to the prophets who came before me can be understood by a parable. A person erected a great building and decorated and adorned it well. But in a corner, he left a niche, an empty space for just one brick. People went around the building and they wondered at its beauty. But they said, why was not a brick laid here? So I am that brick and I am the last of the prophets. And this has been reported in Bukhari. Similarly, in uh, Tarimdi, it has been reported that Prophet Sallallahu said, so I came and I closed the line of the prophets. It has been reported in a tradition that Prophet Sallallahu said, la nabi ba'di wa la ummatan ba'tikum, that there will be no prophet after me and there will be no 
followers of any other prophet after my followers. It has been reported in Mustad Ahmad by uh, Ubayy bin Kaab, Hazrat uh, Abu Sayyid Qudri radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Abu Huraira, the Prophet said, I have been distinguished from other prophets in six things. Number one, I have been endowed with eloquent speech. Number two, I have been succored with awe. Number three, booty has been made lawful for me. Number four, the earth has been made a mosque for me as well as the mean of obtaining purity. This means what? That in the Sharia of Prophet Sallallahu prayer can be offered anywhere on the surface of the earth and not only specific in houses of wor worship. And uh, the second thing which it means is that tayammum is a method for purification uh, using dust. <clears throat> this can be, uh, this can be, uh, this has been made available only for Prophet Sallallahu followers. And the fifth thing is that I have been appointed a messenger for the entire world, as Allah says in Quran, Rahmatul Lil Alameen. And the sixth point is with me, the office of prophethood has been closed. And this is reported in Muslim Tirmidhi and Ibn Majah. Similarly, it's been reported in Tirmidhi that Prophet Sallallahu said, <clears throat> the line of prophethood and apostleship has come to an end. And after me, there will neither be a prophet nor an apostle. Similarly, in Bukhari, Muslim and Tirmzi, it has been reported that Prophet Sallallahu said that I am Muhammad. I am Ahmad. I am the effacer. That is, disbelief will be effaced through me. And I am the assembler. Meaning what? That after me, the people will be assembled in the plane of resurrection. That is, after me, only resurrection will take place. That, and I am the last. After me, there is no prophet. Similarly, it's been reported in Ibn Majah that Prophet said that Allah has sent no prophet who did not warn his people of the coming of the Jal, that is, Antichrist. Now, I am the last of prophets and you are the last community. Therefore, he is about to appear among you now. It has been reported in Bukhari and Muslim that Prophet Sallallahu said to Hazrat Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa salam, but there is no prophet after me. So all these different traditions which have been reported in like all the six books of um, Hadith, the Sahih Sitta, they clearly highlight that Prophet Sallallahu was the last prophet and the concept of uh, seal of prophets is basically an article of faith an article of faith in the prophethood a person who does not believe or take prophet sallam as the last prophet or starts believing in any any other person as a prophet or a messenger of allah after prophet sallam does not complete the article of faith in prophethood and so is not a muslim and is not a believer so explaining all this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has mentioned that uh, they, Allah has blessed him with, uh, since Allah has not blessed him with any male, uh, male uh, children, then Allah has made him the seal of prophets. So now since he is the seal of prophets, what do you need to do? O oh, you who have believed, remember Allah with much remembrance. And exalt him morning and evening and afternoon. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, wa la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. And it is he who confers blessings upon you and his angels ask him to do so that he may bring you out from darkness into the light and ever is he to the believers merciful. Their greeting that day they meet him will be peace, and he has prepared for them a noble reward. O Prophet, وسلم, indeed, we have sent you as a witness and as a bringer of good tidings and a warner. So here there are certain attributes and names of Prophet Sallallahu which are being mentioned. And the one who invites to Allah by his permission and an illuminating lamp. Here Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala has called Prophet Sallallahu as Siraj Munira. 
and give good tidings to the believers that they will have from Allah great bounty. And do not obey the disbelievers and the hypocrites, but do not harm them and rely upon Allah. And sufficient is Allah as a disposer of affairs. O oh, you who have believed when you marry believing women and then divorce them before you have touched them, then there is not for you any waiting period to count concerning them. So provide for them and give them a gracious release. So in this verse, there is an order regarding the divorce for uh, the Muslims and the followers of Prophet Wasallam, And the verse clearly shows that it is permissible to divorce a wife before, after nikah, before having touched the wife. And uh, paying a bride's money in various options has been suggested, and we've already talked about in Surah Baqarah. <clears throat> Verse number 50, O Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, indeed we have made lawful to you, your wives, to whom you have given their due compensations and those your right hand possesses from what Allah has returned to you of captives and the daughters of your paternal uncles and the daughters of your paternal aunts and the daughters of your maternal uncles and the daughters of your maternal aunts who emigrated with you and believing woman, if she gives herself to the Prophet, and if the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wishes to marry her, this is only for you, excluding the other believers. We certainly know what we have made obligatory upon them concerning their wives and those their right hands possess. But this is for you in order that there will be upon you no discomfort and ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Now, in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has explained about the wives of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, about his marriage, how and when it was permitted Rather by, it was not because of Prophet Sallallahu desires or his uh, requirement, but it was only, not only because of the permission, it was all these marriages of Prophet Sallallahu they were by the orders and they were by the will of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Now this verse, it clarifies the allegations Allegation of na'uzu billah summa na'uzu billah min zalik of polygamy on Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. This allegation of polygamy has been made by the anti-Islam agencies to defame Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and also to defame Islam. Uh, obviously, by all these allegations against Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, none of us is deluded. But I will I will just explain the logic with the interest that all of us should understand the wisdom behind all these nikahs and we should be able to negate the defaming tactics of the West. And uh, on all the platforms where these uh, defaming tactics are being purposefully launched and uh, they are trying to misguide the ignorant Muslims. So we are going to go through the basic logics and the wisdoms of uh, justifications of all these nikahs which were made in the life of Prophet Sallallahu just so that we can be among those who can negate all these allegations against Prophet Sallallahu on all the platforms of social media. Now, the basic acquisition which has been put on the Prophet Sallallahu is that Allah has permitted the Muslim men to marry maximum of four women at a time. But then why did this rule change for Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and why did he marry more than four when the rest of the men of his followers, they were permitted only four according to the commandment of Allah. And they, now Zubillah, they say that he indulged in more than four uh, marriages just because of his increased desire. Now Zubillah bin Zalik. Now going through a few reasons is, number one is that there is a difference of orders. 
there is a difference of orders for the prophet and for the followers for certain issues. For example, the hajjud. The hajjud is the salah of night. It was obligatory for Prophet ﷺ, but it is supererogatory for the rest of the ummah. And there is difference of the orders regarding the nikah for Prophet ﷺ also as compared to the rest of the believers. For example, Prophet ﷺ was permitted to have a nikah even without giving the brides, without giving the brides money or the brides gift. That is Hat Mahar. Just with the lady making heba. I will be, we've just read through the translation as uh, has been read here that uh, she gives herself, that a Prophet ﷺ believing women, if she gives herself to the Prophet and the Prophet wishes to marry her. So this is Heba. Heba was only and only permitted for Prophet ﷺ that he could make nikah with a woman if she just presented herself for the nikah without receiving the haq meher. So this is just for Prophet ﷺ and it was not for the rest of the followers. Similarly, after marrying the ordered women, Prophet ﷺ could not divorce them. Another difference is that Prophet ﷺ, uh, after Prophet ﷺ uh, life, the Prophet, uh, the believers, they could not marry the Ummahatul Mu'mineen. They were considered as what? They were considered as the mothers of the believers. Another difference is that uh, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, ordered all the men when they have, when they make nikah with more than one wife, they are duty bound to be fair and just between all the wives. But Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he was not duty bound to treat all the wives equally. And uh, he was granted an option of treating them unequally also. Although he did treat them all very, very equally, but he was permitted and he was granted an option not to treat them equally. But for the rest of the men, if they are marrying more than one, it is an obligation for them to treat them equally. As Allah says in Surah Nisa, Allah ta'dilu If you are not equally treating them, then you cannot avail of this permission. Then you can only just marry one. And so we also know that he was also permitted to... Uh, because of all these differences, similarly, he was also allowed and permitted to marry more than four wives at a time. So this was what? This was a permission of Allah for him exclusively. And some other differences are like, it is an order of Allah that prophet after the death is buried at the place of his death and uh, the graves do not consume the body of the prophets. And similarly, there are many other differences according to uh, the orders and the commandments regarding the prophets and regarding their companions. So this is like the justification why Prophet ﷺ was permitted to have more than four wives at a time. Moreover, we would need to know that all these marriages they had nothing, absolutely nothing to do with the interests or with the desires of Prophet ﷺ. He had agreed to marry all these women purely as an obedience to the orders and commandment of Allah. Just like we've just gone through the incidents of uh, the marriage or the nikah with Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala and her. And uh, Prophet ﷺ, for the fear of opposition, he did not want to marry Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ala anha, but he had just submitted to the order of Allah. And Allah had ordered all these marriages with reasons, wearable reasons, and with different forms of wisdoms behind each nikah. And I will now explain briefly the wisdom behind nikah with each of the wives of Prophet ﷺ. Because if the marriages, uh, uh, moreover, I will also want to explain one thing more is that if the marriages and all these nikahs, they had been because of interest of Prophet ﷺ himself, then why, why his first marriage at the age of 25 years would have been with the lady who was 15 years elder to him? When Prophet ﷺ married his beloved wife, as the Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, he was 25 years of age and she was 40 years of age. 
So why at the age of 53 years, he was marrying a small child, a young child, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, and why all the wives except Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, they were previously married and they were not, they were not maidens. And then why, why did, if it was all these nikahs were made because of the desire and the interest of Prophet sallallahu then why after the conquest of Makkah, when, when he was relatively free and he was influential and he had, he had victory, he had come out victorious and he had choices from all over the Arabs. So why did not he make more nikahs even then? So the verse clearly explains the various categories which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala extended permission for Prophet sallallahu to marry. And I will also be explaining the wisdom behind all the nikahs which were ordered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here in the start, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that uh, the first category in which Prophet sallallahu was allowed to make nikah was those women who, who have been made lawful to your wives to whom you have given their due compensation. That is, ataita ajura hunna. That Prophet sallallahu gave them their haq mahar. And uh, we do learn by traditions that Prophet ﷺ gave Hakmaha to all his wives except the wife who had made herself as a heba. 500 dirhams Prophet ﷺ gave Hakmaha to Hazrat Khadija and Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And otherwise, the Hakmaha which has been proven by the Sunnah of Prophet ﷺ to the rest of the wives is 12 and a half okia of silver. And the next category is Wama Malakat Yaminuk, that uh, those whom your right hands possess. That Prophet was ordered and he was permitted and allowed to make nikah with his uh, with from with what with what his right hands possessed. That is the slave girls. The slave girls who, who were taken as captives and they were made slave girls. Now, in this category. Prophet Sallallahu has been ordered and has been given permission to make nikah. So in this category, Prophet Sallallahu married Hazrat Javeriya radiallahu ta'ala anha. This was after the expedition of Bani Mustalik. The leader of Bani Mustalik, Haris bin Zarar, his daughter, Hazrat Javeriya bin Te Haris bin Zarar, she was taken as a captive. And then by the order of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu when he presented her uh, with the religion of Islam, she embraced Islam. And then by the order of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu made nikah with Hazrat Javeriya, radiallahu ta'ala anha. And similarly, after the Khaybar expedition, the, the leader of the Jew tribes, Hazrat uh, Huyay bin Akhtab, his daughter, Hazrat Safiya bin Huyay bin Akhtab, she was also taken as a captive. And later on, when she embraced Islam by the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Prophet sallallahu made nikah with these two captives in these two expeditions. And these two were taken into the nikah of Prophet Sallallahu And then there were two slave girls who were kept as slave girls um, in the apartments of Prophet Sallallahu These were Hazrat Rehana bin Tishamun. She was the daughter of the leader of Banu Qureza. And after the battle of Banu Qureza in the fifth year, she was uh, taken in as a slave girl. And the, the second was Hazrat Maria Qibtiya, radiallahu ta'ala anha. She was sent as a gift to Prophet sallallahu by the king of Maqaqas. So these were the two who were kept as the slave girls. The third category, which Allah has mentioned here, is the cousins, the maternal or the paternal cousins of Prophet sallallahu And in this category, as we've already read, Prophet Sallallahu had nikah with Hazrat Zainab bin Tijahash, who was the paternal cousin of Prophet Sallallahu And the fifth, uh, the fourth category, which has been mentioned here, is uh, those who immigrated with Prophet Sallallahu And in this category, uh, the nikah was was uh, was with Hazrat Umm Habiba radiallahu ta'ala anha, who was the daughter of Abu Sufyan. And the next category is of Hiba, 
That is, a woman, if she gives herself to Prophet ﷺ and Prophet ﷺ wishes to marry her, this was Hiba. And uh, in this category, Prophet ﷺ was ordered to make nikah with Hazrat Maimuna radiallahu ta'ala anha. And she was the only uh, of the Umahatul Mu'mineen because she had made Hiba. And she had made a gift of herself for Prophet ﷺ's nikah. So she did not receive any haqmahar from Prophet ﷺ. Now, all these nikah, they were by the order of Allah, and they had a wisdom behind each of them. Like Hazrat Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was 15 years elder to Prophet sallallahu and she was a mature, a cool-minded, wealthy lady who could be, who could extend all forms of support which Prophet ﷺ needed. She extended the economic, the social, the psychological support in all forms. She was a tremendous support for Prophet ﷺ in the initial years of prophethood in Mecca. And um, as it is said that behind every successful man, there is a successful woman. So behind Prophet ﷺ was Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And uh, he would remember, he would remember her very frequently even in Medina. And Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was envious and she said that, oh, Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, you keep on remembering the old lady, despite the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed you with younger vibes. And Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam immediately corrected Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, saying that Aisha, don't you say so. She believed in me when no one believed me. She spent on me when no one else did. And she supported me when I was alone. And um, it was about Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha that Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam, he visited Prophet sallam, once and he said that Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she will come. And so you do what? You convey the salam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam to Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. And then Hazrat Jibreel alayhi salam also gave the glad tiding of a palace, palace in the Jannah, which will be carved out of beautiful white pearl. And then the next wife was Hazrat Soda radiallahu ta'ala anha. After the, after Hazrat Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, she passed away. It was the 10th year of prophethood and it has been labeled as Amul Huzn, the year of grief. And there Prophet Sallallahu was with the responsibility of four young daughters and the running of the house with all the commitments of prophethood uh, also going on at the same time. So there Hazrat uh, Sauda Raziallahu Ta'ala Anha, she had the same age as Prophet Sallallahu and she was a tremendous support. And she was uh, a wonderful and just appropriate caretaker for all the system of Prophet Sallallahu domestic system. And uh, she was there to look after the daughters and she was there to take off all the burden off his shoulders. And then the third nikah was with Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And this is this nikah, which is the most criticized. This is the one which was most criticized till now. And this was the nikah which brought the greatest blessings and the greatest goodness and the khair in, um, for, for the religion of Islam. This nikah with Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha and Hazrat Hafsa, this brought the first two caliphs close to the family of Prophet sallallahu because Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was the daughter of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq, the first caliph after Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, and Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala anha, she was the daughter of Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala anha, the second caliph of uh, the Muslims after Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. So the first two caliphs, they were connected directly to the family of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam because of their daughters being the wives of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the next two caliphs, Hazrat Usman radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Hazrat Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, they had the daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam in their nikah. So again, there was an intimate bond with the next two caliphs and Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam also. Moreover, the nikah of Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha has also brought many other blessings as well. She was young. She, at her young age, 
this marriage has been criticized and it has been highly misunderstood. The pre pubertal nikah with Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha was to give an option if needed. It was just, it was not an order. It is not an obligatory sunnah, but what was it? This nikah with Hazrat Aisha in her pre-pubertal period was to give an option of a nikah with a young girl if it is needed in a difficult situation. It is not an order. It is just a permission. Just imagine, for example, if there is a mother, she is dying of cancer and she is in her terminal stages of cancer and she just has one daughter and she has no relative to take care of her only orphan daughter. So what would be a better option? Obviously, rather than leaving her in an orphanage, mother will definitely die in peace if she can marry her off to leave her in an affectionate and a caring protection of a husband and a family. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has laid this precedence by the sunnah that this is permissible if and when needed in any situation. And moreover, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha coming in the nikah and entering into the apartments of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam at this young age, this was the age this was the school age. At her school age, she entered the house of Prophet Sallallahu and spent the years of, um, of the school age and the years of the college age directly, directly under the training and the supervision of Prophet Sallallahu and the education of Prophet Sallallahu And she, at her age, she was totally receptive. She was ready to change. She was adaptive. And this was all because of the flexibility of youth. And uh, moreover, she at that age, she had a remarkable memory. And that is why she could memorize. She could memorize the Quran and she could memorize all the traditions and the hadith of Prophet Sallallahu and that is why she is the one who reports the greatest numbers of hadith after Azad Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala and her. And who she has reported 2,210 ahadiths. It was because of her young age that she could memorize all those traditions of Prophet. And then this nikah was also not because of the desire of Prophet. It was directly as an order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Before the nikah, Hazrat Jibrail alayhi salam, two consecutive nights. Did he show Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and ha? He presented Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and ha in a tray covered and wrapped with a silken cloth. Twice this was shown to Prophet Sallallahu in his dream. So this was indirectly in order for Prophet Sallallahu to make nikah for him. And at this young age, when Prophet Sallallahu um, he after his death, she was like just 18 years of age. And then after his death, she was there to preach and to teach the messages of Prophet Sallallahu and educating all the companions after his death. And she used to perform Hajj every year after his death. And she used to put, his, put her camp and she used to answer the queries and educate about the concepts and teachings and commandments of Quran and the messages of Sharia she used to pass on. And the companions said that one fourth of the religion quarter, one fourth of the religion we received from our mother, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and her. So this was the wisdom behind this nikah. And this is the most highly criticized nikah of Prophet sallallahu And then the next was the nikah with Hazrat Hafsa radiallahu ta'ala and her. This brought Hazrat Umar radiallahu ta'ala and who closer to Prophet sallallahu And then Hazrat Umm Salma radiallahu ta'ala and her, Prophet sallallahu made nikah to Hazrat Umm Salma, and she had orphan children. Prophet ﷺ raised them in his house, and then they became a source of uh, preaching and teaching of Quran and the messages of Prophet ﷺ. And then was the nikah of uh, Hazrat Zainab radiallahu ta'ana anha. We have already gone through the whole uh, verses of Surah Ahzab 
Allah has negated. Allah wanted to negate many customs of the Arabs and uh, many wrong concepts of the people of the book were negated by this nikah and many wrong customs were put to an end. And then the nikah with Hazrat Safiya, with Hazrat Safiya radiallahu ta'ala anha, with Hazrat Umm Habiba and Hazrat Javeria radiallahu ta'ala anha. They were all the daughters of the bitter enemies of Prophet Sallallahu So by the order of uh, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi was made to uh, marry the daughters of the uh, one of the bitter enemies, the leaders of the bitter enemies of Prophet Sallallahu This led to softening of enmity due to the customs of Arabs because it was a custom of Arabs that when somebody became their son-in-law, they stayed humbled to the son-in-law. So this was the wisdom behind these. And uh, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has clearly explained that these has the, all these nikahs were what? They were strictly with the order of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there was no desire and no uh, feeling of Prophet sallallahu which was triggering factor for any of these nikahs. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand all the wisdom and all the logic and make us among those who refute all the allegations and accusations which are being placed na'uzubillah against Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, may put aside whom you will of them or take to yourself whom you will. This was a permission and an option which has been granted to Prophet regarding his wives. And any of that you desire of those wives from whom you had temporarily separated, there is no blame upon you in returning her. That is more suitable that they should be content and not grieve and that they should be satisfied with what you have given them, all of them. And Allah knows what is in your hearts and ever is Allah knowing and forbearing. Now, <clears throat> since all these marriages and all these nikahs were purely dictated by the orders of Allah, so Allah, in order to decrease the matrimonial burdens on Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah gave him the leverage and the option of not treating them equally if he wished. But despite of this option and despite of this leverage, Allah's uh, Prophet Sallallahu treated all his wives with total equality. And the purpose was to educate, to educate and to leave a precedence for the Muslim husbands to protect the right of the Muslim wives. Not lawful to you are any additional women after this, nor is it for you to exchange them for other wives, even if their beauty were to please you, except what your right hand possesses, ever is Allah over all things observer. O oh, you who have believed, do not enter the houses of Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam except when you are permitted for a meal without evading its readiness. But when you are invited, then enter. And when you have eaten, disperse without seeking to remain for conversation. Now, in this part of the verse 53, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is again repeating the ethics of entering the house of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We've already talked about uh, the taking of permission while entering the house. Uh, we've discussed it in um, Surah, uh, Surah Noor in detail. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also mentioning the manner of visiting as a guest. So the rules which we gather from this verse are that, uh, first of all, we need to take permission before entering, uh, as we've already talked in Surah Noor. And uh, the second thing is, which we are learning from here, is that we don't go to a gathering uninvited. It may be, um, it may be a hassle. It will turn out to be a hassle for the host. Like it might just create confusion. It might create misunderstandings. And it might lead to mismanagement for the arrangements of the host. So we need to take permission when we are taking an uninvited guest along with us. And uh, we don't visit anyone at meal timings. 
And uh, after an invitation for a meal, we go and we need to attend the, the invitation. But after the meal is over, we need to return soon. And this, the purpose of all this and the wisdom of all this is to let the host wind up the whole um, whole stuff and to be able to let the uh, host to be able to rest. <coughs> And then Allah says, indeed, that behavior was troubling the Prophet ﷺ, and he is shy of dismissing you, but Allah is not shy of the truth. So this part of the verse and this verse was basically revealed in the background of Hazrat Zainab ta'ala and has uh, Walima and the ceremony of Walima after the nikah. Prophet ﷺ, he hosted a lavish function after the nikah and this was the walima of uh, hazard zainab uh, we do learn from tradition that almost the entire muslim community of medina was invited people they were coming and they kept on coming they had their meals and then after having their meals they would disperse and they would leave but there were just a few a few who just kept on sitting. And uh, Prophet Sallallahu since he was the host, he felt shy to ask them to leave. So while they were sitting, Prophet Sallallahu he just went around visiting his wives. But uh, after making one round, visiting all the wives, when he came back, he found that they were still sitting and they had not dispersed. So he again returned. And uh, when he returned, these verses were revealed and Allah said that Prophet Sallallahu is shy, but he is not shy. So when they went back, then Prophet Sallallahu came back and uh, then the next part of the verse was revealed. When uh, Hazrat, uh, Prophet Sallallahu was going to enter the apartment of Hazrat Zainab, anha, the next part of the verse was revealed and it was said that when you ask his wives for something, then do what? Was aluhunna min wara ikhijab. That when you ask the wives of Prophet Sallallahu for something, ask them from behind a hijab, from behind a partition. Why should you do that? That is purer. That is purer for your hearts and their hearts. And it is not conceivable or lawful for you to harm the messenger of Allah or to marry his wives after him ever indeed that would be in the sight of allah an enormity so when uh, the guests had dispersed and prophet sallallahu was about to enter uh, the apartment of Hazrat zainab radiallahu ta'ala and ha he was uh, just this uh, this verse of hijab hijab this was revealed and so showing obedience to the obedience to the order of Allah, Prophet Sallallahu he hung a curtain on the door of his wife. And uh, this was what? This was Sami'na wa Atwana. And obeying the orders of Allah and following the sunnah of Prophet Sallallahu curtains were hung from the doors of the companions the next morning also. <coughs> So now we would want to understand what hijab means. This is the words of hijab where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering a hijab between the Ummahatul Mu'mineen and the companions of Prophet Sallallahu Hijab means what? Hijab means an obstruction, a partition or a barrier. So the verse implies what? That the companions, when they interact with the Umahatul Mu'mineen, they should ensure that there has to be a barrier, there has to be an obstruction or a partition between them. And the verse is clearly explaining that the purpose of this barrier or this hijab between the Ummahatul Mu'mineen and the companions is what? The, it is needed for the purity of their hearts and their minds. It is needed for their modesty and it is needed for their purity. The order of hijab or barrier, this can be as a door, it can be as a curtain, it can be as a piece of cloth which is intervening. You know, there are certain people who say that this was an order which was just specific for the Umahatul Mu'mineen. And it was an order which was specific for them and for that period. <coughs> Uh, 
we just need to we just need to concentrate and we just need to see for ourselves that if the companions and the ummahatul mu'minin they needed for their mutual interaction they needed an intervening hijab to keep them pure then won't it be needed for the purity of the people of today for the purity of the hearts and the minds and for maintaining the modesty and the morality of the people of today the young crowds of today in the schools in the colleges in the universities with the environments with the social media with the conditions of morality of today in today's environment in today's company would the eyes would the hearts stay pure without hijab allahumma ja'alni min at-tawwabin wa ja'alni min al-mutatahhirin allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the importance of this hijab and help us understand how obligatory and how mandatory it is for the maintenance of morality and the standards of modesty in an islamic society whether you reveal a thing or conceal a thing indeed allah is ever of all things knowing there is no blame upon women concerning their fathers or their sons or their brothers or their brothers sons or their sisters sons or their women or those their right hands possess and fear allah and indeed allah is ever over all things a witness <coughs> verse 56 indeed allah confers blessings upon prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and his angels ask him to do so o you who have believed ask allah to confer blessings upon him and ask allah to grant him peace now in this verse allah mentions about the angels and the lord himself conferring blessings on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and then allah advises the believers to do the same <coughs> this verse allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ordering all of us all the believers to do what to make salam and the salam we do is we uh make salam in the form of the words we recite in our salah at tahiyatul lillahi was salawat wa tayyibat and the durood and the conferring of blessings which has been ordered here we can do that and we can uh, make that in the form of the durood which has been taught to us by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam as allahumma salli ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama sallaita ala ibrahim wa ali ibrahim innaka innaka hamidum majid allahumma barik ala muhammad wa ala ali muhammad kama barakta ala ibrahim wa ala ali ibrahim innaka hamidum majid this was the durood which was taught to us by prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam to be recited in our salah so this is the best form of the durood we can recite Uh, after uh, to obey this verse of allah subhanahu wa taala and the excellence the excellence of reciting the rood for prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam if i sum up many traditions and uh, explaining the excellence is that reciting the rood once that if a person recites the rood once then the person has been promised 10 blessings 10 rewards then 10 major sins being pardoned and forgiven and 10 grades or ranks being raised and similarly we do learn by traditions that if a person is reciting the rood on prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam so as long as the person keeps on reciting the rood then by the order of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is an angel who stands behind the person reciting the rood and the angel goes on asking for his forgiveness and his blessings as long as the person goes on reciting the rood similarly allah uh, prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam has promised in his uh, in his ahadith he has told all of us that if a person recites the rood in the morning and in the evening 
the 10, uh, the, the supplications of the morning and evening, which are made after the Fajr Salah and after the Asr Salah, if everybody recites, and if anybody recites the rule 10 times in the morning and 10 times in the evening, then Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will intercede for the person. And similarly, if a person recites the rood after after answering the adhan and the call of the salah and then makes the supplication which has been taught by Prophet Sallallahu then even Prophet Sallallahu has promised his intercession for that person. And uh, similarly, Prophet Sallallahu has advised to recite plenty of the rood on Fridays also. And then there are the words of uh, a hadith and a true tradition is that Prophet Sallallahu said, that the most miser, the most miser person is the person in front of whom the name of Prophet Sallallahu is mentioned and he does not recite the root. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala Ali Muhammadin. And then Prophet Sallallahu also said that there will be the curse of Allah on three people. One of them will be the person in front of whom the name of Prophet Sallallahu has been taken, has been mentioned, and he did not recite the root. Indeed, those who abuse Allah and his messenger, Allah has cursed them in this world and hereafter and prepared for them a humiliating punishment. And those who harm believing men, unbelieving women for something other than what they have earned have certainly borne upon themselves a slander and manifest sin. Verse number 59. Ya ayyuhan nabiyu, O Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell your wives and your daughters and the women of believers to do what? To bring down over themselves a part of their outer garments. Why should they do that? That is more suitable that they will be known and they will not be abused. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. So in this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has asked Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to announce, to order and to announce and to convey the order of Allah to his wives, his daughters, and the women of believers, because this is a special order just for the Muslim women. Now, this is a commandment. This is a do of the Quran. It is an order of Allah, which is obligatory for all the Muslim women. Just like the order of Allah is for the belief in oneness of Allah, in the belief of prophets, in the belief of the day of judgment, just like the order of Allah for, for offering of salah, for establishing of salah, akimu salata and atu zakata, and then the order for hajj. So similar order and similar obligation is this order and do and commandment of Quran like all the other orders of Quran. So we need to understand and we need to comprehend this special order which has been directly, which has been directly conveyed through Prophet Sallallahu to all the Muslim women of the Ummah. To understand any order of Quran, there are generally basically three modules or three steps which we can generally adopt. The first is of going through the literal word-to-word -word translation of the words to understand the actual and the true meaning of Allah's words. And uh, doing this, that going through the actual word-to-word -word literal translation generally helps us grasp what Allah wants to say and what Allah has ordered. The second step is to study and to learn how did Prophet Sallallahu and his companions who obviously understood the language of the Quran, how did they behave and how did they interpret uh, this order and this teaching and this verse of Quran? And the third step is for a deeper insight is to study and to find out how Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi explained the order. That is the hadith related to this verse 
and how did the companions, all the companions, companions who had learned Quran from Prophet Sallallahu how did they explain and how did they interpret it? And what do the scholars and what do the imams have to say about it? So these are the three methods, why and how we can understand what a verse is ordering all of us. Now, I will go stepwise to understand the message of this verse. The first method of grammatical analysis of the word-to-word -word translation of the verse is, Allah says, Qul, say. Prophet Sallallahu you tell and you order and you announce to whom Azwajika, your wives. So the implementation of the order starts from the personal and the intimate family of Prophet Sallallahu from the Umahatul Mu'mineen, Umahatul Mu'mineen who have been called as what? They have been labeled as role models for the Muslim women. So the first of all, they have been ordered to adopt this dress code because they are the trend setters for the Muslim women of the Muslim Ummah. The second order has been given to the Banatika, to the daughters of Prophet Sallallahu because they are also the intimate family of Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants what? That the intimate family, the personal family of Prophet Sallallahu they, they adopt the color of Islam and they adopt the uniform dress code of Islam. And that becomes exemplary and that becomes a precedence for all the Muslim women of the Ummah. And the third to be addressed are Nisail Mu'minin, the women of the believers. Women of the believers refers to whom? Who are they? Where do they reside? Which part of the world do they belong to? Which period do they belong to? What color, what caste, what creed are they? Nisail Mu'minin are whom? They are the mothers, the wives, the sisters, the daughters of all the believers. Who are they? They are all of us. Nisa il Mu'minin is whom? It is we. It is us. It is the Muslim women of the Ummah, of all the ages, of all the periods till the day of Qiyamah. So, you know, addressing Nisa il Mu'minin here in this verse this solves a very big issue because people who generally try to refute the orders of hijab, who just try to negate the orders of parda in Quran, they come up saying that all these orders are not meant for the Muslim women of today. These, these people, they generally come up saying that these were the orders enjoined for the women in the period of Prophet ﷺ. These were the orders which were given to the Ummahatul Mu'mineen specifically. And why do they do this? Trying to give a false and a soft image of Quran, trying to find out a lame excuse to, to get away from the orders of veil, from the orders of parda, from the orders of hijab. I've already talked about I've already talked about logically that if avoid, avoiding tabaruj and if interacting with a hijab in between was needed to purify the society of Medina and to purify the Ummahatul Mu'mineen and the companions, then it is very, very obvious that the orders are even more important and even more valid for the period of today. I've already talked about the logics. But these words of Nisail Mu'mineen, they solve the purpose of providing logical answer to all such pointless debates. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here directly addresses and calls out the Nisail Mu'mineen and against all nonsensical debates. All nonsensical debates have been clearly negated and refuted. All debates which have been trying to confuse women regarding the clear-cut orders of Quran. The dress code ordered is obligatory for all the Muslim women. Allah says what? Tell them to do what? Yudhanina. So the three addressed categories are now being given the order that they need to do what? Yudhanina. Yudhanina, the root word of Yudhanina is dal, noon, wow. It means what? Danu means 
to make something closer, nearer, lower, or to hang something lower. Yudnina is a verb which orders the plural feminine that they should hang, they should make something closer, nearer. What should they hang and make closer and nearer? And from where should they do it? Explain to the next part. Alayhinna. Ala means over and upon, over them, upon them. What? Jilabi bihinna. Their jilabib. The jilabib of their of these women. Jilabib is what? It is the plural of jilbab. Jilbab in Arabic refers to an outer garment. It is an outer garment. It is a loose, somewhat thick, non-transparent outer garment, which is worn over the dress. You know, the Arabs would know what it means. The Arabs would know what the jilbab means, just like when we say an overcoat in English, we know what it means. So the Arabs know what the jilbab means. I repeat, a jilbab is an outer garment which is worn over the dress. It is loose, thick, and non-transparent. And the purpose of this outer garment, jilbab, is to conceal all the adornments of the woman. So Allah orders the Muslim women who have been who have been addressed previously and who have been mentioned previously in Quran, they've been told that the dress of piety is the best dress for you. And they've been ordered that do not go about exhibiting and demonstrating and making yourself and highlighting yourself and making yourself more attractive and prominent and catchy. And they've been ordered don't exhibit and demonstrate your adornments. And they've been ordered min warai hijab that there has to be an intervening hijab. Now these women have been told very clearly that to adopt the dress code of the previous women, to refrain from displaying any adornments, to conceal your adornments, to have an intervening hijab or a barrier. The Muslim women, what they need to do is that when they go outdoors, or when they interact with the non mehram men, they do what? They should take their jilbab. They should take their outer garments and they should cover their heads with it. And after covering their heads with it, they should hang it from above their heads. They should lower it down from their heads, make it closer, make it nearer to their face and cover up their faces with their jilbabs as well. So what does this jilbab do? This jilbab will cover their garments, being an outer garment. Then it will, it will go to their head, covering, becoming a headdress. And from above their headdress, from above their heads, it will be, it will be hanged down and it'll, it'll be brought closer and it'll be brought clearer, nearer to their faces like a whale. And then Allah explains further that why do they need to do this? Zalika yu'rafna. So that this dress code will let them be known. They will be recognized as pious women, as pious women of modest conduct. And hence they will not be harassed and they will not be abused. So this going through this literal word to word translation of the words clearly makes it so very clear to us. This grammatically analyzed translation of the words of the words will help like 90% of the believing women, they understand the clear cut message of the, of, the words, of the words. Whenever I read and whenever I teach this verse, I feel that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given such a meticulous detail, such a perfect detailing regarding this command that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has not given such a detail even regarding salah. Regarding salah, all what Allah says is what? Akimu salata. Establish your salah. Half is all salah. And that's all. Atu zakata. Pay your zakat. And that's all. Atimul hajja. Complete your hajj. So, but for parda, 
but for Perda and for dress code and for veil and for hijab or Muslim women to the minutest detail with perfection, leaving no confusion. It seems to me like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds the hand of a Muslimah and teaches how to wear, how to wear her jilbab and how to wear her hijab and how to cover it on her head and how to cover it with her face and how to use and wrap up her face with her veil and her hijab and how to lower the piece. Subhanallah, to the finest of detail has this method of taking the veil and hijab and, and adopting the purda has explained in such a minutest of detail with perfection. Subhanallah. But the state of affairs is what Allah mentions in Quran. There is majority of them who don't understand, who don't, who don't comprehend. And there's the majority of them who do not believe. I would definitely say that the only thing is that the order has been given and all the detail of this whale and all the detail and instructions of this parda they have been given in the in the language of Quran. And they've not been issued to all of us in our own languages. Otherwise, all the details explained here are there in precision and perfection for all those who want to learn them. And for all those who want to understand without any obstinacy or without stubbornness. Now, the second method of understanding the order of the verse is to to relate that when this verse and this order was revealed, how did, how did the companions behave? The companions, all of them who, who obviously were Arabs and who understood the language of Quran, how did they behave? How did they respond? How did they reciprocate to the verse? The wives of Prophet Sallallahu What happened? Remember when I explained the incidents of slander the incidents of if against Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she clearly explained that Safan bin Mu'attal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he recognized me while I was sleeping with my face uncovered in the desert because he had seen me before the orders of hijab and jibab were revealed. And then she further added that I threw a part of the sheet on my face to cover it up in the presence of Hazrat Sifan bin Muattal, who no doubt was a non-mehram for Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. Thanks to Hazrat Aisha. Thanks to Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. She highlighted all this to clarify, to clarify all this. Otherwise, there would have been, there would have been a proof for all those fabricating falsehood and creating mischief. And then the daughters of Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa how did they behave? There is an incident in the life of Hazrat Fatma Razilahu Ta'ala and her a companion. She explains that uh, she was the friend of Hazrat Fatma Razilahu Ta'ala and she explains that Hazrat Fatma Razilahu Ta'ala and her, she was, she was one day, she was very upset and she was concerned regarding her purda during her funeral also. And um, she talked to Hazrat Ali Razilahu Ta'ala and when she said that Ali, when my funeral is taken, Take it out in the darkness of the night. Take it out, out in the darkness of the night, so that no one might see my the curvatures and the figure of my body. Now, realizing the concern of Hazrat Fatma, her friend says that she suggested that when I had migrated to Abyssinia, there I saw a structure. A structure was made with branches and was fixed above the funerals to conceal it. And uh, so this was the modesty of whom? Binatika, the daughter of Prophet Wasallam. She was concerned about her purda even after her death. And how did the Muslim women of Medina behave? Hazrat Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and Hashi narrates that after the revolution of these verses, curtains were hung on the doors of the Muslim houses. And the Muslim women, when they came outdoor, they came as if, Hazrat Aisha explains the word, 
they were clad in big black jilbabs to make them look like big huge black crows all dressed up and draped in black covering garments and then there's the story of hazrat umay khalad radhiyallahu ta'ala anha she in a expedition she got the news that there was her son and her brother they had been martyred and when prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam arrived in madina despite such a great loss when she came out she was dressed up wearing a jilbab and she was wearing a veil and the companions they were shocked to see her modesty and her dress code even in this state and they inquired that in such a grief also you happen to maintain your purdah and she said what she said was not just what she told the companions and she answered the companions it is no doubt a message to all the umma it was a message to all the umma she said brothers i have lost my dear ones but i have not lost my haya i have not lost my haya i have not lost my modesty so this is the message to the whole of the umma how how are we how are we losing our haya we've just lost our haya and we've lost our modesty isn't it so how beautiful young muslim girls of today go about they go about in their schools in the colleges in the universities in the marketplaces in the streets walking around with their hair loose tossing their hair here and there semi dressed in transparent fitting clinging dresses no head no head dresses sleeveless garments wearing perfumes and cosmetics and makeups of all sorts and you know what their fathers their brothers walking walking with them in all those streets shoulder to shoulder with them proudly owning them introducing them as very confident successful progressive girls where are we where are we as a umma where are we heading on to what are we as a umma up to what is all this about isn't isn't this gross disobedient to the orders of allah isn't this all intense transgressions to the limits of allah let us all revise let us all revise the orders which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given all of us all the muslim women in quran in surah araf allah ordered libasu taqwa zalika khair the dress of piety the dress of modesty the dress of the god fearing people is the best for all of you then in surah nur allah said wal yadribna bi khumrihinna ala juyubihinna then when you are indoors even inside your houses do what you take your headdresses and then you wrap up your headdresses even to cover your chest and then in surah nur allah said wala yubdina zinata hunna do not go about in the muslim society oh muslim women you do not go about in the muslim society showing about exhibiting demonstrating all your adornments and we've talked about that in surah nur and then in surah ahzab allah ordered wakarna fi bayutikunna reside content peaceful with honor and respect reside in your houses they are your basic places they are the places of your duties and then in surah ahzab allah ordered wala tabarajna there was a law of quran do not go about in the streets outside your houses outdoor exhibiting and demonstrating making yourself highlighted catchy attractive prominent and then allah ordered wasaluhunna min waraa'i hijab there has to be a barrier between you and your non mahram men and this is the last but not the least yudnina alayhinna min jilabi bihin you know what when all these orders were revealed in the quran and all the sunnas of all the companions and all the ummahatul mu'minin and binatul binatul rasul sallallahu alaihi wasallam they were they were 
precedences, what happened, that obeying all these commandments of Quran, the companions, the companions, the Sahabiyat, they moved along with the Prophet Sallallahu and the companions, the Sahaba Ikram, the caravan of Prophet Sallallahu they moved with them shoulder to shoulder with the Muslim men. They were learning Quran, they were teaching Quran, they were preaching Quran, they were doing trade, they were doing businesses, they were doing jobs, they were doing, they were doing public welfare, they were, they were going and joining the battlefields, and so on. But they were in the dress code. They were in the dress code, very gracefully adopting the dress code, the limits of the dress code, which have been ordered by Allah. They were doing, they were doing activities in all spheres of life. They were attending to their duties inside the house and outdoor. They were coming out, carrying all activities in all spheres of life, but very much within the prescribed and the obligatory limits and the dress code of Quran. But then what happened was there was a slow and steady poisoning by shaitan. The shaitan was what was suggested the Muslim men that, oh, oh, you, you have beautiful daughters. You have beautiful daughters and sisters and wives. Why don't you show their teeth and you sell your toothpastes? Why don't you show their beautiful long tresses to sell your hair products? You can, you can demonstrate them in your catwalks and you can promote your designer dresses. You can display their beautiful faces and introduce your cosmetics. And, and they started selling her. And the daughter of Hava was sold. She, with her beauty, was sold and she is being sold. She is still being sold. The daughter of Hava is being sold in the ads, in the sign boards, on all the social media. Everywhere the daughter of Hava is being sold. A Muslim woman of today, she gets up, she uses all the blessings of Allah, her health, her wealth, her time, her money, she uses all the blessings of Allah and she makes a dress. She makes a dress for herself, which her husband wants her to wear, which her family would appreciate, which would impress her friends. But while preparing her dress, she forgets the dress which the Lord would like. The sustainer has ordered. The master would appreciate and Allah Rabbul Alameen has ordered. وَقَانَ اللَّهُ غَفُورُ الرَّحِيمَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us all. Allah help us all. Allah guide us all, protect us all, forgive us all. Help us all, guide us all, protect us all, forgive us all. Allah forgive us all. Allah forgive us all for whatever we have wronged. Pardon us all for, for what for what we for whatever we did which angered you, which we did beyond your limits, which we wore beyond your limits, which we crossed beyond your limits, which we disobeyed, which we transgressed. Astaghfirullah Rabbi min kulizam bin wa atubu alayk. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, now we believe, now we believe, now we believe. Rabbana innana amanna faqfir lana zanubana wa kina azab al-nar. اللهم إن قرفوا قريم تحب الأف فقونا 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 اللهم اغفر لنا وللمؤمنين والمؤمنات والمسلمين والمسلمات. If the hypocrites and those in whose hearts is the disease, and those who spread rumors in Medina do not cease, we will surely incite you against them. 
then they will not remain your neighbors therein except for a little while. Accursed, wherever they are found, being seized and massacred completely. This is the established way of Allah with those who passed on before, and you will not find in the way of Allah any change. People ask you concerning the hour, which hour? The hour of death or the hour of the day of judgment. People ask you concerning the hour, say the knowledge of it is only with Allah. And what, and what may make you perceive perhaps the hour is near. In this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after giving the orders of the jilbab and the orders of wail and hijab, is talking about the hour being near, the time of death or the time of the day of judgment being near. Why is this being mentioned like that? Because you know that after listening to the orders of Allah, people generally, if they find it difficult to obey, there are going to be orders and commandments of Allah, which certain people are going to find difficult to obey. So when people listen to certain orders of Allah, which they find difficult to obey, then they tend to delay and they tend to postpone the obedience of the orders. Although what a believer is supposed to do is what? Samirna wa atwa'na. When they listen, when they understand, when the order gets to them and they can wait and they are made to understand a commandment of Allah, they need to samirna after listening and understanding and comprehending, they need to do say and do what? Atwana. We obey, we surrender, we submit, and we adopt the teachings and messages of Allah. Or as Allah mentioned about the behavior and the manner of Hazrat Ibrahim Aslim, qala aslam rabbil alameen. That when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, submit, surrender, a believer needs to do what? Like Hazrat Ibrahim Islam did, without any delay, without any postponement, without any debate, discussion, cross-questioning, interrogation, any doubt, any confusion, obey, surrender, submit to the order and commandment of Allah. So for postponing, postponing the obedience, we should know that we are unaware how long we are going to live. So no one, when receives and understands an order of Allah, should delay or postpone the obedience or submitting or surrendering to the orders of Allah. Indeed, Allah has cursed the disbelievers and prepared for them a place. Here, Allah is mentioning that the disbelievers are cursed. Curse makes a sin a major sin. And curse is a thing where Allah mentions this in Quran or Prophet mentions in it in Hadith. Curse is a condition when the person will be deprived of the mercy of Allah. And Prophet ﷺ has informed all of us that a person who is cursed and is, is deprived of the mercy of Allah will be what? Will not be able to enter into Jannah without the mercy of Allah because he said that Aisha, even I will not be able to enter Jannah without the mercy of Allah. So in this verse, Allah is explaining the curse and the preparation of Sarira, the blaze of the hellfire for the disbelievers, for the kafirin. Who are the kafirin? The kafirin, the disbelievers are, as I explained in the one of the first few classes of Surah Baqarah, the kafirin are, are those who refuse to believe, who refuse to believe in Allah, in Quran, and in Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or who fail to accept or believe or obey the orders of Allah and Quran and Hadith. So failure to believe in them or to believe in the orders and to obey the orders is both what? Is disobedience, curse for disobedience, and hell fire for disobedience the blaze of hellfire for those who listen to the commandments of Allah, who listen to the commandments of Quran and then refuse to accept and obey. 
for them is the curse and for them is the tiding of hellfire. Allahumma ajirna minan nar, Rabbana, innana amanna, faghfir lana zanubana, fakina azaban nar. And hellfire, they will be till when those who listen to the orders and teachings of Allah, to the do's and don'ts of Quran, and then they do not obey, they do not adopt the commandments, they transgress and they cross the limits, for them is curse and for them is hellfire, till when? Khalidina fiha, abiding therein forever. There will be, there will be an eternal abide. Okay, fine, someone will take them out and they will finally come out. No, Allah says, they will not find any protector or helper. Those who listen to the teachings and messages of Quran, the do's and don'ts of Allah, the commandments of Allah, the limits of Allah, and they do not believe in it, and they have doubts in it, and they do not obey what they have been ordered, and they cross and transgress the limits of what they've been ordered, then they have been cursed, they will be in hell fire, and they will abide there eternally, and they will not find any helper and protector. What will be their condition in hell fire? The day their faces will be turned about in fire. Their faces will be tossed and turned. They will be roasted on the hell fire, and they will say, how we wish we had obeyed Allah and obeyed the messenger. Allah says, Yawma taqallabu wajuhahum finnar. Their faces, they will be tossed and turned and roasted on the hell fire. The hell fire, which is 69 times higher temperature than the fire of this world. Their faces those faces which they found difficult to cover with the veil, the faces which they found difficult to cover with the veil, the faces will be roasted in hellfire. Allahumma ajirna minan nar. And then there will be regrets. They will regret that in this worldly life, they disregarded the orders of parda. They regarded the orders of whale. They disregarded the orders of hijab. And they had followed and they had copied and they had idolized the trendsetters of the society. And they will say, and they will say, our Lord, indeed, we obeyed our masters and our dignitaries, and they led us astray from the right path. Our Lord, give them double the punishment and curse them with a great curse. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala explains that in this worldly life, they receive the orders of Surah Nur, Surah Araf, Surah Baqarah, Surah, surah Al-Ahzab, but they disregarded them. They condemned them. They were, they were confused. They were doubtful. And they started idolizing and they glamorized and they started copying the top stars of their society, the trendsetters of the society, and they followed the dress code they adopted and they were misguided and they were cursed. And then they will regret that woe to them. They would regret that they had obeyed the orders and commandments of Allah. O oh, you who have believed, be not like those who abused Musa, alayhi salam. Then Allah cleared him of what they said, and he is in the sight of Allah, was distinguished. O oh, you who have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. In this word, verse, Allah says, says, this implies what? That after receiving the orders of dress code for the Muslim women, because of certain issues, because of your certain issues, if you do not, if you do not obey the commandments or you, you feel that you cannot obey and you cannot uh, obey or you cannot adopt this dress code, then at least, at least do one thing that by your word of mouth, at least say what is right. At least in your conversations, acknowledge. <coughs> <coughs> at least in your conversations acknowledge and mention the true orders of parda like we do see and we do come across people many people falsifying the orders of allah 
falsely saying that there's no order of Quran regarding the covering of head. There's no order of Quran. There is no verse of Quran where Allah mentions that whale is mandatory and obligatory for Muslim women and they need to cover their face. There is no verse of Quran regarding the commandment of whale or hijab or parda. So this verse suggests that even for all those failing to obey, do go about, do not go about saying false things, trying to cover up or trying to justify your shortcomings. Don't commit a double disobedience. Please, please don't commit a double disobedience. One, of physically disobeying Allah's orders, and second, of verbally disagreeing and negating Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's true commandments by word of mouth. Accept the true orders of Allah, at least if you do so. Believe the truth in heart. And when you believe the truth by a word of mouth, and when you believe the true commandments in heart of hearts, what will be the result? He will, who Allah will, then amend for you your deeds and forgive you your sins. And whoever obeys Allah and his messengers has certainly attained a great attainment. So Allah says here that if at least you start accepting the true commandments in your heart and you start announcing it by the word of mouth, then Allah will amend your deeds. The chances of amending lie only for a person who believes the true orders. Because those who refuse to believe, those who refuse to believe in their heart, by their mind, and even by the word of mouth, those who refuse to believe will never realize. They will never ever even realize that they are disobeying. Hence, there will be no chances of amending their deeds also. Allahumma ja'alni min al-tawwabina wa ja'alni min al-mutatwahireen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand the correct and the true orders and the truth of all the orders and help us obey the true orders and commandments. Indeed, we offered the trust to the heavens and the earth and the mountains and they declined to bear it and feared it, but man undertook to bear it. Indeed, he was unjust and ignorant. It was so that Allah may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women, and the men and the women who associate others with him, and that Allah may accept repentance from the believing men and believing women. Ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Allahumma gfir lana, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us with belief and faith. And Allah bless us with steadfastness of belief and faith. And may, make us all from among the believing men and believing women. And Allah forgive us all. Oh merciful Allah, believe us, forgive us all. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us, help us have strong faith and belief. Help us obey and follow the teachings we have received. Make it easy for us. Make this obedience, make this submission, make this surrendering easy for all of us. Take away all the opposition. Help us stay and tread on the straight and the right path. Help us stray steadfast on the sarat mustaqim Bless us. Bless us all with helpers and supporters in this sarat mustaqim Make our families, make our, our husbands, our children, our friends as supporters in our obedience. Ya muqallib al-qulubi, sabbit qalbi ala dinik. Ya musarrif al-qulubi, swarrif qalbi ala tu'atik. Allahumma alhimna rushdan wa aizna min shuroori anfusina. Allahumma rahmatika arju fala takilni ila nafsi min tarfata aynin wa aslihni shakni kullahu la ilaha illa anta. 
ربي اعوذ بك من همزات الشياطين واعوذ بك ربي ان يحصروني يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث يا حي يا قيوم برحمتك نستغيث رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي واجعل لي وزيرا من اخلي رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين رب اغفر وارحم وانت خير الراحمين استغفر الله ربي من كل ذنب واتوب اليك استغفر الله ربي من كل ذنب واتوب اليك استغفر الله ربي من كل ذنب واتوب اليك ربنا لا تزغ قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك الرحمة إنك أنت الوهاب سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب عليك سبحان ربك رب العزة أما يسفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين آمين سمامين